Uh, welcome, everybody. I'd like to call the meeting to order and welcome everyone in attendance. The committee has under consideration the main estimates of the Ministry of Affordability and Utilities for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2024. I'd ask that we go around the table and have members introduce themselves for the record. The minister, please introduce the officials you have joining you at the table when we get to you. Uh, my name is David Hansen. I'm the MLA for Bonneville Cold Lake St. Paul and chair of this committee and we'll begin starting on my right. I'm Richard Fee and the MLA for Edmonton Rutherford. Good morning. And Shane Getson, the MLA for Laxon and Parkland. Uh, Josephine Pollan for Calgary Bennington. Uh, Ron Orr, MLA for Lacombe Pinoca. Afternoon, everyone. Cyril Turton, MLA for Spruce Grove Stony Plain. Good afternoon. RJ Sigurdsson, MLA for Highwood. Good afternoon, everyone. Peter Singh, MLA Calgary East. A good, uh, good evening. Uh, Matt Jones, MLA for Calgary Southeast and Minister of Affordability and Utilities. I'm joined by my Deputy Minister, Stephanie Clark, uh, Matt Grossman, my Assistant Deputy Minister of Financial Services and Senior Financial Officer, David Stanford, uh, Assistant Deputy Minister of Affordability, and Andrew Buffin, Assistant Deputy Minister of Utilities. I'm also joined by Chris Hunt, the Utilities Consumer Advocate, who is seated in the gallery. Kathleen Gadley, Calgary Mountain View. Good afternoon, everyone. Chris Nielsen, MLA for Edmonton Decor. Drew Barnes, MLA Cypress Medicine Hat. Warren Huffman, Committee Clerk. And we have nobody joining online, so we'll move on. A few housekeeping items to uh, note. Uh, for the record, Honorable mm -hmm. Member Pawn for Honorable Member Isaac for substitutions. Mm -hmm. uh, please note the microphones are operated by Hansard staff. Committee proceedings are live streamed on the inter internet and broadcast on Alberta Assembly TV. The audio and video stream and transcripts of meetings can be accessed via the Legislative Assembly website. Members participating remotely are encouraged to turn on your camera while speaking and mute your microphone when not speaking. The remote participants who wish to be placed on a speaker's list are asked to email or message the committee clerk. And members in the room should signal to the chair. Please set your cell phones and other devices to silent for the duration of the meeting. <clears throat> Honourable Members, the standing order set out the process for consideration of the main estimates. A total of six hours has been scheduled for consideration of the estimates for the Ministry of Affordability and Utilities. This meeting is the first three hours for consideration of the Ministry's estimates. Standing Order 59.01-6 establishes the speaking rotation and speaking times. In brief, the Minister or Member of Executive Council acting on the Minister's behalf will have 10 minutes to address the Committee. At the conclusion of the Minister's comments, a 60-minute Speaking block for the official opposition begins, followed by a 20-minute speaking block for independent members, if any, and then a 20-minute speaking block for the government caucus. Individuals may only speak for up to 10 minutes at a time, but speaking times may be combined between the members and the minister. After this, speaking times will follow the same rotation of the official opposition, independent member, and the government caucus. The member and the minister may speak, each speak once for a maximum of five minutes, or these times may be combined, making it a 10-minute block. If members have any questions regarding speaking times or the rotation, please send an email or message to the committee clerk about the process. With the concurrence of the committee, I will call a five-minute break near the midpoint of the meeting. However, the three-hour clock will continue to run. Does anyone oppose taking a break? Seeing none, we will make that announcement shortly. <clears throat> Ministry officials may be present and at the discretion of the or at the direction of the minister may address the committee. Ministry officials seated in the gallery have called upon have access to microphones in the gallery area and are asked to please introduce themselves for the record prior to com commenting. Pages are available to deliver notes or other materials between the gallery and the table. Attendees in the gallery may not approach the table. Space permitting, opposition caucus staff may sit at the table to assist their members. However, members have priority to sit at the table at all times. If debate is exhausted prior to six hours, the Ministry's estimates are deemed to have been considered for the time allotted in the schedule and the Committee will adjourn. Points of order will be dealt with as they arise and individual speaking times will be paused. However, the speaking block time and the overall three-hour meeting clock for the first segment of the six hours allotted will continue to run. Any written material provided in response to questions raised during the main estimate should be tabled by the Minister in the Assembly for the benefit of all members. The vote on the estimates and any amendments will occur in Committee of Supply on March 16, 2023. Amendments must be in writing and approved by Parliamentary Council prior to the meeting at which they are to be moved. The original amendment is to be deposited with the Committee Clerk with 20 hard copies. 
An electronic version of the signed original should be provided to the committee clerk for distribution to committee members. <clears throat> Finally, the committee should have the opportunity to hear both questions and answers without interruption during estimate debate. Debate flows through the chair at all times, including instances when speaking time is shared between a member and the minister. I would now invite the Minister of Affordabilities and Utilities to begin with your opening remarks. And you have 10 minutes, sir. Thank you, and good evening. I'm pleased to present highlights of the 2023-2024 budget for the Ministry of Affordability and Utilities. Again, I'm joined by my Deputy Minister, Stephanie Clark, Matt Grossman, Assistant Deputy Minister of Financial Services and Senior Financial Officer, David Stanford, Assistant Deputy Minister of Affordability, and Andrew Buffin, Assistant Deputy Minister of Utilities. We also have Chris Hunt, the Utilities Consumer Advocate, seated in the gallery. Before I dive into the budget, I'd like to give a brief overview of the Ministry's mandate. The Ministry of Affordability and Utilities was established to deliver immediate cost of living and inflation relief while also working across government and with utilities to support long-term affordability. On the affordability side, this includes leading and coordinating the government's affordability action plan. As the lead, we are working with other ministries to implement a package of affordability measures, including Treasury, Treasury Board and Finance, Children's Services, Seniors, Community and Social Services, Technology and Innovation, Service Alberta and Red Tape Reduction, and other ministries as required. Our affordability action plan includes both broad-based measures supporting all Albertans, and targeted supports for those most impacted by inflation, including families, seniors with fixed incomes, and vulnerable Albertans. These measure measures include electricity rebates, suspending the fuel tax, direct payments to those most affected by high inflation, reindexing financial benefit rates for AISH, income support, the Alberta Seniors Benefit, and the Alberta Child and Family Benefits. New targeted affordability supports for post-secondary students, funding support to food banks and other community groups, and more funding for low-income transit pass programs. On the utility side, the Ministry works to advance a modern, safe and reliable system that meets the everyday needs of all Albertans and attracts investment and supports job creation. Through Budget 2023, the Ministry will continue work to, to work towards the outcomes outlined in our business plan, which I will address shortly. At this point, I will move on to our budget highlights. For the Alberta government overall, Budget 2023 continues to provide relief through the Affordability Action Plan, which will see Albertans continue to benefit from ongoing programs such as our fuel tax relief program, electricity rebates, natural gas rebates, and monthly $100 affordability payments for seniors, families, and Albertans on core support programs. The government is planning $2.3 billion in affordability supports for the 2023-24 fiscal year, with the total cost of living supports for Albertans since 2021 to 2022 amounting to $8.7 billion through to 2526. This spending represents one of the most comprehensive packages to support citizens with the cost of living of any province or territory in Canada. For affordability and utilities specifically, in 2023-24, the Ministry has budgeted $139.8 million in expense. Included in this amount are the following major items. $47.6 million for the utility rebate uh, in 23-24. The funding will follow through on our commitment to provide a total of up to $500 in electricity rebates to over 1.9 million homes, farms, and small businesses as part of our affordability action plan. The 2022-23 third quarter forecast for the utility rebate and grant programs was $647.8 million. The next major item is $33.5 million to support the operating costs of the Alberta Utilities Commission which tracks customer service quality in its regulated utilities and regulates electricity distribution rates. This is up from $30.7 million in Budget 2022. The total budgeted funding amount for the AUC includes a $2.8 million increase in 2023-24, then increasing another $765,000 in 24-25, 
and 788,000 in 2526. Primarily for salary expenses and to align compensation with market rates and a 0.8 million increase to the AUC's supplies and services beginning in 2023-24 as it transitions to cloud-based IT solutions. Budget 2023 also includes 31.5 million consisting of 19.1 million of non-voted interest expense related to the annual payments for the coal phase-out agreements and 12.4 million voted operating expense for the renewable energy program. Coal phase-out expense for budget 2022 was 21.4 million and renewable energy program expense for budget 2022 was 12.4 million. The final major item is 27.2 million to support ongoing department operations and programs. This is up from 21.4 million in budget 2022. And just a reminder here that budget 2023 includes funding for the UCA, the Utilities Consumer Advocate, a critical resource for utility consumers that has demonstrated its impact in supporting affordability for Albertans. Notable changes for budget 2023 include a $500,000 increase beginning in 23-24 for the Rural Gas Program to support rural gas across the province over the next 10 years, and $250,000 in one-time funding in 2023-24 for a review of the current state of water associations across Alberta and to identify the path forward. I will now touch on the department's one item in its revenue forecast. For 2023-24, we estimate that the ministry's revenue will be about $149 million, primarily from, ba from balancing pool income and industry levies and licenses. Now with my remaining time, I will give you a brief overview of the department's two outcomes that make up the 2023-2026 business plan. The first outcome is making everyday life more affordable for Albertans. To achieve this, we are committed to the following three key objectives. To continue leading and coordinating the government's ongoing efforts to identify and advance opportunities to address affordability and cost of living concerns of Albertans. We have already made considerable headway towards this objective given the ambitious package of supports, both short term and ongoing, to support affordability for all Albertans to provide financial relief to Albertans through programs such as the Natural Gas Rebate Program, the Electricity Rebate Program, and the Remote Area Heating Allowance Program, to educate, mediate, and advocate for Alberta's small business, farm, and residential electricity, natural gas, and water consumers through the Utilities Consumer Advocate. The second outcome in the business plan is to ensure Albertans benefit from a safe, reliable and affordable utility system. To achieve this, we are committed to five objectives. One, to enable a modern, competitive and adaptive electricity system for Albertans to support job creation, attract investment and support the adoption of lower carbon energy in the province. Two, to address the cost of utility payments for Albertans by ensuring regulated rates for electricity and natural gas are formulated to best serve Albertans and reviewing transmission, distribution and other costs. Three, to support the expansion and upgrading of rural utility infrastructure to encourage socioeconomic growth and rural job creation. The fourth key objective is to ensure the safe, reliable, efficient and environmentally responsible development and operation of the electric and natural gas systems to protect the public interest of Albertans. And the fifth key objective is to ensure Albertans benefit from a safe, reliable and affordable utility system. To conclude my remarks today, I will restate that the Ministry is keenly focused on providing both short-term relief while also doing the long-term work to ensure we keep Alberta affordable for the years to come. We have acted swiftly and decisively to help individuals and families get through this time of high inflation and we will continue to build on that success going forward. I look forward to the questions of this committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. And just before we get, get going, we do have six hours here, but I just encourage all committee members to 
let's make the best use of our time and keep our questions relevant to the ministry. I know that there's a, a bit of crossover that we will we can expect, but uh, if you if you do persist in uh, a line of questioning that's off topic, I will call you to order. For the hour that follows, members of the official opposition and the minister may speak. Honourable members, you will be able to see the timer for the speaking block both in the committee room and on Microsoft Teams. Uh, members, would you like to combine your time with the minister? Uh, I'll certainly try, Mr. Chair. And if that's amenable with the minister? Uh, block time. Block time? All right. Uh, you have 10 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, so. I want to start out by saying that I think uh, the one thing that we can all agree on is that uh, this is an issue that's of critical importance to Alberta, uh, Albertans at this time. Um, I think inflation is at an all-time high uh, and wage growth, uh, particularly in Alberta, is, is much lower than the rest of the country. Um, we have relatively high unemployment compared to the rest of the country, so people are, um, I think, challenged more so than they have been probably at any time um, in the last couple decades. So I think um, I agree that this is, is a ministry that um, is doing some incredibly important work. Um, the cost of everything has gone up, electricity, natural gas, groceries, tuition, interest on student loans, and insurance. Um, I, I'd like to know, um, you know, generally, so obviously we've created a new ministerial office that comes with political staff, that's a, a cost to the people of Alberta. Um, I, I'm curious um, sort of what other actions are taking. Are we examining um, things like, um, you know, things that affect um, affordability generally like uh, tuition or groceries? Uh, I think we called for an investigation in that um, th that was, was never taken up. So I'd love to know what's going on with those. Um, I think as well, um, you know, the minister mentioned several times the natural gas rebate. This thing was originally announced um, almost a year ago now, I think. Um, at the time, <laughs> at the time, we called it a fake, um, mostly because it wasn't expected to come in for quite a while. Um, I don't actually see it reflected in the budget, so um, I'm just curious because, you know, it was our position at the time that that was a fake rebate, that there was not going to be actually any money there. Um, so I'd love to know um, how much was spent last year on that natural gas rebate. Um, I'd also love to know, because I don't see it in a line item here in your budget, um, so I'd, I'd love to know how much you expect to spend this year uh, on the natural gas rebate. Um, because it continues to be our position that this is, is a program that's essentially lip service. It was floated um, at a price that rates were not really projected to hit. Um, so yeah, I would love to know how much has been spent and how much we expect um, will be spent. And, and I'd, I'd love, Minister, also your opinion on whether you think that that is sufficient uh, to help people, the people of this province. Um, yeah, I know, I mean, we don't have actuals for some reason, but we do have forecasts, so uh, we can we can get some, I would hope, <laughs> estimation of how much uh, was spent last year. Um, I think on that, um, on that note as well, um, the electricity rebate, now certainly one of the things that we have heard uh, from people across the province is that a lot of multi-residential buildings were excluded. Uh, so those are buildings that have like one meter for everyone because obviously the power for the whole building will be much higher than the threshold. Um, I'm just a little curious as to why that decision was taken and what the explanation to people living in those buildings because they're um, for the most part suffering from the affordability crisis just as much as anyone else. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would love to hear, you know, for those people, and, you know, we've heard extensively from groups like the Conado Owners Association that they feel this, it creates a real unfairness. Um, so I'd love to hear if there's any plans to address that going forward to sort of fix that problem and that particular exclusion, and if not, why not? Um, and why... I guess why the problem hasn't been solved yet. Um, it seems like there, there are possible solves, or at least I can imagine possible solves. Um, we also heard from a lot of people that $50 relative to the actual increase in price was insufficient. Um, and so I would like to hear 
yeah, a little more about, about the minister's opinion on whether that was in fact enough. Um, another electricity program is the electricity loan deferral program that the UCP brought in. Um, and so I, I would love to know as of right now, what is the total owed by Albertans on the RRO as a result of this loan deferral program? Uh, and so, you know, we can obviously estimate um, because the, the ceiling is at 13.5. So everything above that um, up to, I think it's, um, yeah, would be sort of going into this, into this loan. Um, and we're almost... Well, I guess we're still in March. We're almost to the end of the period. So that would give us sort of a, a, a snapshot, I guess, of how much Albertans are going to owe. Um, I'm also curious because, I mean, personally, I, I don't think the program design is particularly good. Um, I don't think that more debt is the thing that Albertans need right now. Um, but it begins to pay back in April. So um, essentially, you know, once you have the total amount... Uh, what I'd like to know is how much uh, total debt we have so far and how how that would spread over RRO customers, so about how much roughly each individual person owes. Um, I'd also be really interested to know um, what, what we expect prices to do in like July and August because obviously we have this, this ceiling right now and everything's being pushed into this loan. But July and August will be months in which the loan is being paid back by Albertans. Um, and at the same time, their prices may be higher. Like last summer, we saw certainly not the spikes we saw this winter, but we saw at the time those were record high power prices. Um, so I'd be interested to know what the ministry's estimate is on what the prices will be in July and August when people are having to pay back. So, I mean, essentially they're potentially paying whatever the going rate is, plus they're paying off this loan that the government has foisted upon them. Um, so yes, to sum up, what is the total, um, what is the total amount owed by RRO customers as a result of the loan deferral program? Um, on average, how much do you think that that will be for each person? Like how much do we expect that to add to each person's bill over the repayment period? Um, or on a month-to-month -month basis, either or is fine. Um, how much are we expecting roughly power prices to be in July and August while people are having to also pay off this loan? Um, yeah, so those are, those are the questions on uh, that sort of set there. Um, so those are, those are those programs, I guess. Um, I think um, I'll also move on to another program that's reflected in here, and I'm, I'm pretty confused about why it's reflected as a cost and not a revenue. Um, so the University of Calgary uh, has done, and I'm, I'm citing here, um, it's called Energy and Environmental Policy Trends. It's October 2022, uh, and Alberta Wind and Energy Windfall. Um, by uh, Sarah Hastings Simon, Andrew Leach, Blake Schaefer, and Tim Weiss. Uh, and they cite that the total gain to the government of Alberta is expected to be about $160 million from the renewable energy pro electricity program. So I'm just curious where that revenue um, is reflected in the budget, because it's showing up as a cost, but certainly this would suggest that it's not a cost. And I mean, these calculations can make, be made as the strike price was. Um, uh, public at the time and so surely the government would be able to I guess um, surely the government would be able to calculate what the expected revenue is um, but I, I can't find it in budget so I would love to know where that is located um, because I think you know people deserve to know what the outcome of that project was and the way it's reflected in this budget uh, now would suggest that the government is not, in fact, making money from it, which I think, I mean, these numbers may be imperfect because obviously we don't know which strike price applies to which contract and therefore sort of the size of the whole thing, but, um, you know, these are estimates and they, they're estimates made on the most sort of conservative assignment of those, of those contracts to uh, solar, so, uh, to solar and wind projects, so... Um, 
yeah, I, w I would be interested to know where that, where that revenue is reflected because I think it's pretty clear that it exists. Um, the next set of questions I have focus a little bit on the business plan. Um, so uh, business plan performance metrics under 1B, performance ind indicator, Alberta annual inflation rate compared to national levels. Um, I'm just sort of uh, looking for an explanation of how those numbers are calculated, um, sort of like what, whether it's based on Statistics Canada data or like where, yeah, where we're getting those percentages from. Uh, and I have three seconds, so I just will. Thank you very much, <laughs> Member uh, Minister. You now have 10 minutes to respond. Uh, thank you very much for the questions, and uh, there are many questions. I'll try to get through as many as I can, and of course we can address them in the next block as well. So fully agree that affordability is the number one issue facing Albertans and indeed Canadians, and that is the result of record inflation. Uh, and that's why our government came forward with uh, our affordability action plan, which includes significant broad-based and targeted inflation relief. And I just want to go through some of those measures so, so uh, everybody understands the programs that we're talking about today. We, of course, uh, fully suspended the fuel tax. So from January to June of 2023, Albertans will save 13.6 cents per liter, uh, including GST, on every liter of gasoline and diesel. In addition, since July of 2022, we've been for providing uh, electricity rebates to uh, upwards of 2 million homes, small businesses, and farms across Alberta. Uh, up to $500 over the course of the program, an average of $50 a month, although the January and February uh, 2023 rebates are $75 each in recognition of the, the higher demand and colder winter months. We also implemented a natural gas price protection program. We were concerned about the price spikes seen in other uh, countries around the world. Um, we, were, we were concerned about geopolitical events supply and demand imbalances, and we wanted Albertans to be protected and uh, benefit from their own resource. And what that program does is if the Alberta price of natural gas exceeds 650 a, a gigajoule, Albertans will receive a dollar for dollar rebate on the natural gas portion of their bill. And I want to highlight that this program is now a permanent feature of Alberta. Like our fuel tax relief, these are two ways that Albertans will continue to be protected and save money um, from their own resource. And we should be proud of our oil and gas sector, our responsible oil and gas sector. In addition to those programs, we also indexed core support programs. Those include AISH, Income Support, the Alberta Seniors Benefit, and the Alberta Child and Family Benefit, which increased 6% this year and will continue to increase annually with the cost of living. We also retroactively indexed income taxes uh, to January of last year. And this means that come tax time, and people are already working on their taxes, they're going to see higher refunds, lower taxes owed. And it also provides ongoing relief because, of course, it's also indexed. So uh, going forward, Albertans will have uh, lower withholdings <coughs> on their paychecks, another great affordability measure available to all Albertans. Uh, the big one our affordability payments. We knew that even with these broad-based measures, there were categories of Albertans that were being hit particularly hard by inflation. Those included families with multiple dependents, many mouths to feed. Uh, and so we wanted to provide additional targeted inflation relief. And that is $600 in, infl in affordability payments over six months from January to June uh, 2023. Seniors on lower and often fixed incomes also have been particularly challenged by the inflation crisis. And so they too, 65 and up seniors in Alberta, are eligible for $600 in affordability payments over six months. And then we also automatically enrolled Albertans on uh, our core support programs. So any Albertan receiving AISH, income support, the Alberta Seniors Benefit, or the Alberta Child and Family Benefit, or receiving services through PDD was automatically enrolled and is receiving up, up to $600 over the next six months to help them pay their bills, to take a little pressure off, especially families who are making tough choices. You know, can they keep their kids in their activities? 
And we certainly didn't want children after the two years that they experienced in, in the pandemic uh, to have to make those choices. And uh, a reputable economist has estimated that the, the additional uh, burden on families due to excess inflation is around $90 per month per child. So th these affordability payments should provide Alberta families significant flexibility and peace of mind and ensure that children don't pay the price of inflation. In addition, we've recently announced post-secondary affordability measures. We've all seen the increases in interest rates, the dramatic rise in interest rates. And so just a few weeks ago, I joined the Minister of Advanced Education and we announced uh, reductions in student loan interest rates. We also doubled the interest-free uh, deferral period from six months to 12 months because we know that students, uh, they're facing cost of living increases just like everybody else. And we wanted to give them enough time to find gainful employment. Perhaps they can tap into the 100,000 job vacancies in Alberta, which is booming. I would disagree with the characterization uh, through you, the chair, uh, the member opposite. The Alberta is booming. But we wanted to provide them additional time, additional peace of mind, so they could focus on their studies, focus on employment, and not worry about inflation. We also paused auto uh, insurance rate increases. So I worked with uh, the Minister of Treasury Board and Finance, um, and uh, we announced that until January of next year, auto insurance rate increases will be denied. And that should provide um, you know, some cost certainty for Albertans at a time of rising costs. Uh, the Minister of Seniors, Community and Social Services recently announced additional support to food banks. We'd heard a concerning rise in the use of food banks and, and we wanted to help. So for the first time, we're contributing $20 million, 10 million of which is uh, earmarked for matching campaigns. But we wanted to ensure that our most vulnerable uh, had access to nutritious meals when and where they need it. We also have made uh, investments to support low-income transit programs because we know that it's expensive. It has been expensive to get around, and we wanted to make sure that our lowest-income Albertans were able to get where they needed to go, whether it's work or school or to get groceries for their family. So those are just uh, those are a quick high-level overview of some of the affordability measures that we've been working on. And it ties into your question of what is our ministry doing? Well, to, to implement these programs, we had to work across government. So for the fuel tax relief, we had to work with Treasury Board and Finance. For the natural gas price protection program, again, we had to work with uh, Treasury Board and Finance. Age income support, the Alberta Seniors Benefit, we worked with our partners in seniors, community, and social services. The Alberta Child and Family Benefit, we worked with our partners in children's services. Post-secondary, we worked with uh, the Ministry of Advanced Education to bring forward that suite of affordability measures. And we'll continue to look across government at ways that we can save Albertans money and ways that we can keep Alberta af affordable. This ministry is also responsible for utilities. We share Albertans' concerns about the rising cost of electricity, of transmission and distribution. We also share Albertans' concern about the record pricing and volatility on the regulated rate, rate option. And so we're working within our own ministry, with our agencies, to ensure that the path forward is one that is affordable for Albertans. Um, you asked some specific questions, the member opposite asked some specific questions. Uh, the natural gas rebate, I'm pleased to report that to deliver a billion dollars of electri electricity rebates, and again, that's up to $500 a household in Alberta, the most significant in the country, to provide a billion dollars in support automatically to these households and to an end to provide permanent year-round natural gas price protection the administration costs were minimal it was around nine and a half million dollars for both programs in terms of what the natural gas rebate program will cost we'll, we'll have to see uh, how it is utilized because of course it's intended to protect Albertans from spikes from unforeseen uh, perhaps globally driven events uh, but uh, the cost will, of course, uh, be reported once we use it. You asked about the RRO price ceiling and deferral. Um, again, the RRO electricity price uh, in January and February was hitting some of the highest levels ever, and it was extremely volatile, which is challenging for uh, particularly seniors in rural Alberta. 
and we wanted to provide them stability on their electricity bills. So we implemented a 13 and a half cent per, a cent per kilowatt hour uh, price ceiling, which meant that any amounts in January, February, or March of 2023 uh, above 13 and a half cents were deferred. And they were deferred to lower cost months starting April 2023 so that Albertans could more easily manage the bills. And I want to be clear that we provided, the government provided no interest loans to RRO providers so that this price deferral, this price protection could be provided at no interest, at no interest cost to the RRO provider or to the consumer. And this mirrors fixed rate rep protection. So on competitive fixed rate contracts, you pay a little more in the low months in return for price protection in the high months. And that's exactly what we've done through much, the RRO uh, price ceiling deferral. Um, number, are you going to continue with your questions? Yes. Yeah, go ahead, member. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I must congratulate the minister. I think that's the first time I've seen a minister get through eight minutes without answering a single question. Um, so I will restate the questions uh, for the record. Um, did you have something to add? Um, so I will restate the questions uh, for the record. Uh, so the first question was... Uh, how much has been spent on the natural gas protection so far? Uh, the second question was, how much do you anticipate being spent next year? Um, this is a, a budget, so the function of a budget is to project, project how much things will cost next year. So I think it's uh, pretty well in bounds, especially given that you raised it three times in your opening remarks, for me to ask how much will that cost next year. Uh, because I, I, I think that the actual answer is zero, that you know that it's going to cost zero. Um, so I think uh, the next set of questions was around uh, the electricity rebate. And just to, to restate the question for the minister, because I think you might have missed it, um, it's, you know, what do you have to say to people in those multi-residential buildings um, that did not receive a rebate? Um, have you made attempts to fix it? Do you intend to fix it in the future? Um, and so I think, um, yeah, I, those are questions I've certainly been getting from the public, from constituents. Um, I imagine that uh, members on the other side have been getting those same questions. So, um, yeah, I think that they're worthy of, of answering. Um, in terms of the electricity loan deferral program, um, again, the question was, how much do Albertans on the RRO owe currently? Uh, so what is what is the total amount uh, that Albertans on the RRO uh, currently owe? How much do we expect them to be paying back per month? Roughly is good enough. Um, and and what are we expecting uh, prices to be in the summer? So what are we expecting prices to be in months like July and August? Um, because the the justification that's being provided for this sort of like loan deferral program that's being put on Alberta Albertans is that. Um, it's in some way like a fixed-term contract, uh, is I think what I heard you say, um, and that people will pay, you know, more in some months and less in, in other months. Um, so obviously, in order to make that statement, you must have some sort of belief that in summer, the the costs will be lower and significantly lower enough to offset. Um, the loan repayment, so you obviously you must be anticipating that they'll be lower than 13 and a half cents. So I'm just wondering sort of what the guess, like what the what the projections say about how much uh, that is going to be. So those were, oh, yes. And the other question was about where the revenue from the renewable electricity uh, program is reflected in the budget and how much in total uh, you are expecting that to be. Um, so those are the ones from the last set. There's a couple that I have um, arising. Uh, one comment, which is to say you re-index benefits and taxes because you are the ones who de-index them. Um, the other one is to say, um, so I'd like to know a little bit more about this pausing of auto uh, insurance rates. Um, I... Uh, because it wasn't in this budget, I, I hadn't realized, but luckily the ministers raised it and therefore put it in play. Um, so I'm just curious because the information we have shows a 16% increase at Aviva, 13% at Trader General. So it's showing um, auto insurance going up significantly, like 16, 13%. These are significant increases in people's auto insurance this year. Um, so I'm a little curious um, what, 
what's going to happen there? Does the government have some sort of enforcement mechanism uh, that you intend to use against these folks? Because obviously if there's a cap and they've raised insurance rates, that would be uh, in violation of some sort of law, I would presume. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious what the outcome on that is going to be. Um, sorry. Uh, oh, the regulated rate option, and this is just arising, although I have heard it before, is it the intention of the government to get rid of the regulated rate option? Um, I, I would be interested. I think that's an interesting question. Um, complicated question, but an interesting one. Um, so, yeah, I, I would like to know kind of what, what the intention with that is, because it's sort of, this isn't the first time it's been implied that that might be on its way out. So uh, I think that's important information uh, for Albertans. Um, and then the final question was on the calculation of the performance indicators in 1B. Um, yeah, I don't need a complex calculation, but just sort of generally where the data was drawn from or whether it's sort of like an average of several sources. Um, also in the business plan, so key objective, 2.1, sorry, I have so many documents open here. Um, key objective 2.1 uh, states that uh, one of the key objectives is to enable a modern competitive adaptive electricity system for Albertans to support job creation, attract investment, and support the adoption of lower, lower carbon energy in the province, um, which I think is a good, a good, uh, uh, objective. Um, I'm just curious uh, with respect to that. So one of, one of the things uh, that would obviously do that, and I think this government must agree because you passed a bill to this effect, uh, is the adoption of energy storage. Um, and so uh, a bill was introduced uh, and then died on the order paper, it was introduced again and then passed. Um, that would enable storage. But at this point, um, the sort of ongoing problem is with the way storage acts in the market. So it's charged as essentially a generator and a load currently. Um, and that affects the economics significantly. And a lot of folks would argue and have argued to me um, that that is, is a fairly major hindrance in terms of adoption of storage on the grid. In fact, probably the major hindrance at this point. Um, now, I know uh, that this is work that is done uh, with the ASO, uh, and so I'm just curious, you know, when, like, in light of the fact that storage, you know, it increases reliability, it defers transmission costs, um, it's likely to bring down prices, it sort of increases uh, the ability of the grid to pro provide dispatchable power. Um, I'm just curious when we expect that work to be completed because I think it's, um, you know, it's pretty important. Uh, the ideal time would have been two years ago, but no time quite like the present. So, um, you know, when are we expecting that to come forward so that Albertans can see that start to happen? And what's kind of, what, what's the hold up? Are there ongoing consultations? Is there some sort of uh, difficulty? I feel like the act was passed a while ago now. Um, so, yeah. I have been getting many questions from, from folks uh, in the industry about when we expect to see that, uh, and so I think that would be important. I think it's um, important to Albertans as well, because I think it, it affects the prices in the long term, and I think the minister at the time said that in introducing the bill, so um, I, I, would, I would imagine that the government position is one that agrees uh, that that's important and will, in fact, uh, bring down those prices. Um, the next question I have on the business plan. So um, under key objective 2.2, uh, it refers to ensuring regulated rates for natural gas and electricity are formulated to best serve Albertans. I'm just curious what that means, whether you're sort of reviewing um, the way that's done, because it's typically done by independent bodies. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious sort of what impact the government ha has or what impact the government intends to have or how how you're going to ensure that formulation because I I mean my take had been that the sort of existence of independent review was was one of those things um, so I'm just curious um, 
the the next um, metric talks about uh, reviewing transmission distribution and other costs. Um, I'm just curious what that means. Will it be a public review? Will there be stakeholder input? Will it be a legislative assembly committee? Um, who, who will be doing the reviewing um, and whether that will be public? Because I think the public has a fairly keen interest in this. I know mostly it's done by the ASO with the exception of a previous conservative government that passed a a bill to build some extra transmission lines, um, but yeah, I'm just I'm just curious how that review is going to take place and what um, whether you anticipate anything changing uh, as a result of that. Um, and I think at that point, okay, we got 12 seconds. Maybe I'll just uh, give up those 12 seconds and look forward uh, to the answers. Thank you very much, Minister. You have 10 minutes to respond. Uh, thank you very much. So. Uh, our government um, is helping com combat the rising cost of living by providing protection from high natural gas prices. And we implemented the natural gas rebate program to ensure that customers would not be subject to high winter heating costs, as seen elsewhere. As part of the Affordability Action Plan, we announced that the natural gas rebate would become a year-round price protection program to ensure Albertans are protected from price spikes in heating costs. Uh, the rebate will provide critical price protection for more than 1.6 million Albertan homes, farms, and businesses using both natural gas and other heating fuels. The natural gas rebate, again, will be triggered if the monthly natural gas rate charged by any of Alberta's regulated utility providers, that could be Apex, ATCO, uh, North or South, is above 650 per gigajoule. Eligible, eligible consumers connected to the natural gas system will receive the rebate automatically on their bill as a credit during the rebate periods. Albertans will automatically receive the rebate on their bill if they are a connected natural gas consumer who is either on a regulated monthly gas rate or competitive plan or and uses less than 2,500 gigajoules of natural gas annually. Rebates will cover the difference between 650 a gigajoule and the highest regulated rate for that calendar month. For example, if the highest monthly rate is 750 a gigajoule, all eligible consumers would get a rebate on their bill covering $1 for every gigajoule consumed. Albertans who use other heating fuels and non-connected natural gas for, their, for purposes of heating are also eligible for the natural gas rebate program. Their rebate is triggered by the same criteria, uh, but there are limits based on the number of liters of propane, heating oil, and kerosene utilized. Uh, combined with nearly $1 billion in supports through the electricity rebate and our fuel tax pause, uh, this program is certainly helping Albertans uh, by shielding them from high energy prices. But I want to be clear that it was never intended to pay day-to-day uh, -day utility bills. This program was put in place to shield Albertans from exceptional price increases in natural gas as seen in other parts of the world because Albertans should benefit and be protected from their own resource. Um, the electricity rebates for... Uh, Single metered and sub metered units. This is certainly an issue that we've heard about. Um, so, uh, a reminder that we are providing electricity rebates up to $500 per household to, uh, to 2 million households, farms, and small businesses across Alberta. And that's applied directly to electricity bills. The challenge for us uh, in terms of single and sub metered is that we don't have, we do not see individual customers, individual Albertans or their units behind the single or sub meter. And so we have been exploring solutions because we know that they've been facing high energy costs just like every other every other Albertan. And we certainly would like uh, to provide them these rebates as well. And there is ongoing work uh, to, to uh, explore ways that we can provide this relief. But I want to be clear, we have to do it in a way that's non-taxable. We have to do it in a way that does not jeopardize or threaten the uh, not-for-profit status of some of these condos. So we're working with condo boards, we're working with condo associations to find the best way to do that. Um, the RRO ceiling and deferral, you asked about how much has been deferred. It's, it's approximately $250 million that we expect to defer uh, over the January, February, and, month, uh, and March months. And this is real relief for Albertans um, because these bills, I can tell you, would not have been manageable particularly for those on low and fixed incomes. And the recovery period is 21 months. We expect um, uh, 
the, the recovery amount to be around two cents a kilowatt hour. Extremely manageable. Uh, again, mirroring fixed rate protection. Paying a little bit more in the lower months beginning April in, in return for protection from some of the highest uh, electricity months ever in Alberta's history. And again, the government provided no interest loans so that RRO providers could provide this protection at no interest expense to the RRO provider or to Albertans. I think it's also worth mentioning that Albertans have choice when it comes to their electricity. They can choose to remain on the regulated, regulated, regulated rate option or they can explore competitive plans. And those plans uh, can be fixed, guaranteeing a price over a term, or they can be variable if an Albertan chooses. Uh, the Utilities Consumer Advocate is a great resource to evaluate the options that are available to you. Uh, you uh, the member opposite had inquired about uh, prices in July and August. I can just tell you that we expect them to be lower, certainly, than, uh, the, def than the price ceiling months. So Jan the intent was to take the extreme volatility, the extreme shock of the January, February, and March bills away and to provide stability for Albertans. And uh, the deferral months will be lower than those. And uh, so that's why we did it that way. So we expect July and August to be lower, uh, certainly than, than January and February. Um, I'm going to get uh, Matt to comment on uh, your question on the RE program as it is in our books here and the performance measures you inquired about. Thank you, Minister. So uh, you asked about the uh, renewable electricity program and uh, where that's included. Um, so the RET program is highly dependent on the wholesale electricity price, which is very volatile and difficult to predict. Uh, we don't anticipate the current high pool prices to continue in the long term and are taking steps to address these costs to make electricity more affordable going forward. For example, we're re reviewing aspects of Alberta's distribution and transmission policies and how we can maximize the efficiency of our existing system. We've also passed the electricity statutes, modernizing Alberta's Electricity Grid Amendment Act to enable the integration of new technologies into the system to meet the evolving needs of consumers and industry. So as a result of this volatile uh, program and the steps we're taking, we've taken a conservative and consistent approach by budgeting expenses of 12 million per year from 22-23 to 25-26. Uh, we do recognize the revenue that's being generated to date has been $136 million since the inception of the program, and that's up to December 30th, 31st, 2022. This revenue goes into the government's general revenue fund, and it is reported in under other revenue in our annual report. And the ministry is reviewing our for forecasting of this volatile program, and if needed, we'll update our expense and revenue forecast in the 2023-24 first quarter fiscal update. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, your next question was on um, automobile insurance. And uh, I'll provide some commentary, but I would, I would encourage you to direct questions on uh, insurance to Treasury Board and Finance. We know that uh, many Albertans are struggling with rising cost of living, and that certainly includes automobile insurance costs. Uh, AARB data shows that the 12-month average of approved private passenger vehicle rate changes was 3.17% in uh, 2022, uh, well below the inflation rate. Uh, but we heard concerns from other Albertans over the potential for auto insurance rate increases, especially given the other affordability challenges that they're facing. So we, uh, as of January 25th, 2023, our government paused private passenger vehicle insurance rate increases through to the end of this year, until January 2024, Insurance companies also must now offer payment plan options to ensure that, that Albertans don't have to pay the full year's premium upfront while these rate increases are paused. Uh, people drove less during the COVID-19 pandemic, leading to reduced claims and increased industry profits. Inflation and the return to more normal driving patterns are expected to stabilize premiums further. These are temporary measures to give Albertans some breathing room while we explore longer-term solutions. And our goal is to steady auto insurance rates in the province and ultimately lower them for Albertans. So again, uh, further automobile rate insurance uh, rate increases requests will be denied until January, uh, the earliest January of 2024. Um, your next question was on the future of the RRO. 
and I, I believe it relates to Key Objective 2.2. I've only got a minute here, so we'll, we, but we can touch on it in the next uh, block. But we've seen record pricing, record high costs, and record volatility in the regulated rate option for electricity. And what we've all, what's also become clear from the feedback from our constituents and the, uh, and certainly the feedback I've heard, is that Albertans, uh, uh, Albertans may not understand the volatility inherent in the regulated rate option. It's essentially a price taker uh, with, a, with a few months delay. Um, and so we've put together a working group of RO providers to explore the future of the RO. So the question is, does the RO make sense given the potential volatility inherent in its design? Uh, do we need to uh, change it? Do we need to wind it down? It was never meant to be a permanent thank feature you, of our electricity Galli, market. If you wish to continue, uh, you have 10 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you. Those uh, those were helpful. Um, I am just going to return briefly to the natural gas rebate because this is, like the budget includes that which has occurred in the past, but also that which occurs in the future necessarily. Um, and so the, I mean, the, the main thing that we're here to discuss tends to be the estimates. And so the estimates are for next year. Um, what I'm not seeing is an estimate for the natural gas rebate. So that would suggest to me that you are estimating that it will be zero dollars um, or you would have put it in the budget. So that's, I'm just trying to confirm whether, whether your projections would suggest it'll be zero dollars or not. Um, I think uh, the questions around the electricity deferral program, I think, have um, mostly been answered. The only remaining one is um, you said that you expected prices in July and August to be lower than they were during the months in which you created the loan. Um, do you expect them to be lower than 13 and a half cents? Because otherwise, like even if they're at 13 cents, when you add two cents on, now they're at 15 cents. So they're higher than, or even, I mean, they could be lower and still considerably higher than 13 cents, like say 25 cents. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious about that. It's just, it seems like a, a weird, I mean, obviously I think it's a weird program, but. Um, so some of the other questions um, our working group, right, so we were on um, reviewing of transmission, distribution, and other costs. Um, I think you probably caught those the first time, so I'll just uh, leave them to be, to be gone back to um, at a later point. Um, in terms of the actual, sorry, so not in the business, well, I guess they are in the business plan too, but I'm going to look at them in the estimates anyway, uh, in the government main estimates. Uh, line 1.1, the minister's office, uh, it's up 48%, which seems like quite a lot. Um, inflation is high, but it's not 48%. Um, and that's, I mean, that's just political staff. Um, now, I had wondered whether it was because it was split off from energy, um, but the minister of energy's office also jumped from 667 to, or sorry, from, well, the, the number shown is 666, so that would be uh, 6,000, because they're in hundreds of thousands. Anyway, it jumped up almost a similar percentage, so almost 48% as well. Um, and so, oh no, sorry, a little bit less, but still, a very large percentage. It went from 667 to 1048. So, um, yeah, not expecting you to answer for that, just that it wasn't that they split the two ministries. Like, they both gone up. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think I'd like an explanation as to why it was that more, 48% more political staff was necessary uh, in, in the minister's office. Um, the other questions I had, um, so line 2.1, affordability and utilities, the budget for 2022-23 was... Uh, about five million. Uh, we're now up to twelve million. Um, I guess if you round it up, it was almost six. But still, it's almost doubled. Um, I'm just a little bit curious what that what 
what what underlies that particular change? Because I don't think like those aren't the actual payments because they're underlying three. Um, I assume that that's just like government staff that support the payments. Um, so I'm just curious why it doubled. Um, utility grant and rebate program. Uh, we have a forecast 348 547. I'm assuming that that is um, that number is the number uh, the number for um, the the utility payments that have gone out to consumers. I just want to confirm that that's the only thing that's in the line. So it's uh, and then there's 47 million yet to go next year. Um, And I'm curious then also about a couple of things that we're not seeing in here, um, because it is the Ministry of Affordability and Utilities. So I'm curious where uh, the affordability payments are, um, whether they're, because this is just utility rebating grant program, so I'm guessing they're not in that line estimate. I'm just curious what line um, they're in. I'm also, I mean, yeah, I understand because of the, the amount of reorganization that has occurred that actuals haven't been provided, which I think is not a thing that has happened in my memory of a government budget. Um, but I'm just curious if we know whether that is in fact the actual or how close it's going to be to the actual. Um, I'm also curious of where, as to where the cost of the fuel tax rebate would be reflected. I'm assuming it's just in revenue or lack thereof, and you can back calculate it from there. I think actually, Minister, you probably said. Um, right. Um, sorry, additional questions. Um, oh. Yes, we missed this at the beginning. Um, I'm also curious um, whether the government intends to do any sort of further investigation in terms of grocery prices. I know we tried to sort of launch a committee and that um, was voted down uh, by government members. Um, I'm just, yeah, I'm curious um, in light of the fact that that is or tends to be, uh, for a lot of people I hear from, a pretty significant pinch point. Um, whether there's any plan to look into that. And I think people are, um, at least the people I hear from, uh, they, they tend to relay a certain level of skepticism. And the reason for that skepticism is, is we're seeing sort of record profits posted by those companies at the same time. And we know from producers um, that it's not, it's not the cost, like they're not making more money on, on their end. Um, it tends to be somewhere else in the system. So I'm just curious if there's a plan to look into that because I know it is, yeah, it is a real, a real big stress point for a lot of people. Um, and I think, I mean, maybe there's an explanation. There's just no way to know at the current time. And that's why we had been hoping to, uh, set something up to examine it. Um, but I think, I mean, obviously that was voted down, but perhaps there is another way. Um, apologies, I know I have one more arising and I don't want to miss it because I think my block is almost over here. Um, we got the $250 million. Um, Oh, yes, the natural, the natural gas prices. Um, I think we got that one. Uh, apologies, I'm just... Uh, I got a lot of notes. Oh, sorry. Um, just to return to the in, the um, insurance issue, that was the thing I wanted to go back to. Um, so I think I just perhaps misunderstood a little bit um, because my understanding was it was frozen until the end of this year, which is 2023, so until the beginning of 2024. But we are seeing these large increases um you know, from several, I've just cited 16 and 13 from two particular um, places. So I'm just um, uh, curious, I guess, how we reconcile that, um, whether it was like, you know, this was announced and then these costs went up. And so I'm just curious, like, was it announced for a future time? And so they sort of raised their rates in anticipation 
um, of later being locked down that kind of looks like what happened. Um, like the government sort of, yeah, told them we're going to freeze it future, and so they raised them quickly uh, <laughs> before that happened. Um, but I'm just curious why those would go, why those would go up um, at this point. Um, I did ask about the cost of a fuel tax relief. Um, oh, I was wondering too. Um, you, Minister, you when you were speaking about um, how much the government was providing in utility relief, you included the number for the AUC. Um, and I mean, I think that organization has been around for a while, so I'm just curious if you could break out that $2.3 billion number um, into, uh, into its component parts. Um, and I will let those four seconds go. <laughs> uh, thank you, and Minister, you have the remaining 10 minutes. Yeah. And thank you for the questions. Um, I'm going to start back on the RRO because I think it's a very important topic. Uh, the regulated rate option w was never meant to be a permanent fixture of our market. And I've met with Albertans who believe that just based on its name, there's some inherent protection uh, in the regulated rate option for electricity when in actual fact um, that would be uh, a description that would be more uh, suitable for fixed rate uh, competitive uh, electricity contracts. So uh, we are doing a review of the regulated rate option uh, because we want to ensure that if it continues that it is meeting the needs of Albertans. And I would say that, that it would have to have stability, uh, less volatility in pricing for Albertans to be a suitable mechanism. If not, then there is, uh, of course, variable options available if in the competitive market. Uh, for electricity pricing. So we're going to work with uh, RO providers, stakeholders, and of course Albertans uh, um, uh, on that review uh, to make sure that we get it right. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Matt to comment on uh, the, the increases that you asked about in the Minister's office as it, as it transitioned to being a ministry and, um, and also on your specific uh, line items uh, request related to the electricity rebates. Thank you, Minister. So as you referenced uh, the, the percentage increase, it's, it's a little over $200,000 that was increased in the uh, Minister's office budget. Um, so that is primarily due to the Department of Energy. They did transfer two FTEs, so that is not a net new uh, for a total of six FTEs sitting in the Minister's office. Um, to, and as well as to uh, the Minister's office is delivering on the Ministry's mandate, which includes setting up the Ministerial office similar to those of other government ministries. As this is a newly created ministry a staff complement is required to oversee the activities of the programs of this ministry as well as the uh, ministries that it's coordinating. The budget allocated to the minister's office represents a lean office size of six FTEs for that uh, cost that you, that you referenced there. The minister's office will continue to monitor its, monitor its cost uh, to ensure all spending is essential and non-discretionary. Now, you also asked about the utility rebate grant programs. I believe you referenced the $348.5 million. Um, and yes, that's what it's missing though, or what's, what you also have to tie in is the contingency fund. So there was $286.8 million that uh, was funded for the utility rebate program out of the contingency. So together with that 348, the total was $635 million for the utility rebates that uh, was funded from the vote uh, as well as from the contingency. Thank you very much. And that ties into the, the natural gas price protection program, which you've been uh, which the member opposite has been inquiring about. It, it is intended to provide protection from an ex exceptional price increases in natural gas due to events, uh, unpredictable events, largely beyond anybody's control, um, like the situation we've seen in, in Europe. Um, but we have a contingency. And, and should the natural gas rebates um, be triggered, we'll, of course, uh, make sure Albertans receive that support and those amounts would come out of contingency. Um, you, the member opposite inquired uh, about the affordability payments. And just to recap, uh, our government put forward a targeted relief. In addition to the broad-based relief of the electricity rebates up to $500 a household, the fuel tax suspension and the natural gas price protection program, which is estimated to be $900 in benefit to households not receiving affordability payments, 
We also came forward with targeted affordability payments for seniors, 65 and up, families with dependent children under 18 years of age, and, and for Albertans who are receiving Alberta's core support programs, which includes age income support, receiving services through PD, the Alberta Seniors Benefit, and the, the Alberta Child and Family Benefit. And we launched that in, in January, and I was, you know, I got a, my hat is off to the professionals at Technology and Innovation. Uh, because they stood up the, the portal, which enabled us to give, uh, provide the support uh, months earlier than would be possible through, for example, the Canada Revenue Agency. Uh, they stood that up, and within three weeks, certainly in less than a month, we had one million Albertans enrolled to receive, or already receiving, affordability payments. And uh, around 300,000 of those, our most vulnerable, automatically were enrolled. They didn't have to do anything uh, but their affordability payments started rolling in at the end of January. The specific question was, where are these? The affordability payments can be found in the, in the uh, Seniors Community and Social Services uh, Ministry uh, for seniors and for Albertans on most of the core support programs. And then uh, in Children's Services, you'll find the amounts for uh, dependent children and also for uh, the Alberta Child and Family Benefit Recipients. I should also note that we extended the affordability payments to foster and kinship caregivers because, like anyone else caring for uh, children, more mouths to feed, uh, and inflation was hitting them particularly hard. So uh, that was another category that we automatically enrolled in our affordability program, which I think is, is working very well. I've certainly heard uh, fantastic reviews on the average six-minute uh, onboarding time. Uh, we did have some... Albertans who entered incorrect banking information, as always happens with some, some program, but that was around or less than 1%. And we've since launched an edit functionality so that they can simply update their banking information. And the program is designed to provide Albertans all the payments that they're eligible for, no matter when they apply. So between now and June 30th, if an Albertan applies and is eligible, they will receive that month's amount and any retroactive uh, amounts that they may have uh, that they were eligible for had they applied earlier. So again, uh, we're confident that we're going to get all that money to the uh, Albertans who need it, uh, and they need it. Uh, uh, the member ops had inquired about the fuel tax relief. And of course, this, we're not paying this. We are simply not collecting a tax, and that can be found in uh, Treasury Board and Finance. But uh, this is not just an affordability measure. This is a competitive measure. This makes Alberta a destination uh, to live and do business. We have... Uh, the lowest fuel costs in the country and by a huge margin. Uh, the last time I looked, it was it ranged from 20 to 40 cents per liter. And we've certainly he heard that that's helping families. To give some perspective, an average driver uh, driving a, a car for, from January to June 30th could save as much as $200. I know uh, I have constituents driving trucks who are, who are going to save about $600 over that same period. So this is, this is significant relief, and again, uh, pleased uh, to enable Albertans to benefit from their own resource. There was also some questions on, are these prices being passed on? Well, our government has certainly been monitoring the situation, and so have third parties, including leading economists. And they've concluded that, yes, the fuel tax relief is being passed on. And the significant proof point is comparing Alberta's fuel costs to neighboring jurisdictions. And again... Alberta has by far the lowest fuel prices in the country by significant margins. Just look at BC, look at Saskatchewan, then come back and fill up in Alberta because it's cheaper here. Um, the member opposite had also inquired about insurance. Again, uh, I would encourage uh, those questions to go, for, for specifics, to go to Treasury Board of Finance. But the, 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 the uh, pause, the direction to the ARRB to not approve any further rate increases came into effect in January, and it is effective until the end of this year. So there were some rate increases that were approved uh, before the pause period, and, and of course those are, are carrying on. There's also, um, if somebody gets tickets or circumstances change, they move, they switch vehicles, those can also cause um, insurance rates to change. But I want to be clear. We, we heard from Albertans that they were concerned about the rising cost of fuel. We addressed it, fuel tax relief. We heard them on electricity, electricity rebates, RO sealing and deferral, and we're re reviewing the whole system for affordability. We heard that they were concerned about automobile insurance rates. So we have prevented further increases in auto insurance. 
so um, all of our programs are in response to the needs of Albertans, uh, and we're working to keep Alberta affordable for them. And uh, last question, I believe, uh, and the member can clarify, um, you had a question about either the AUC or the UCA. I was unclear which organization um, you wanted me to comment on. Actually, can't go back and forth, but uh, you can use okay. up here. <laughs> My apologies there, but but um, actually, we've got Chris Hunt here from the UCA. Oh, he's only got a minute. I don't want to put him up here for 15 seconds. So I'll be happy to um, uh, to comment on the UCA if that's the, the organization that you were referring to in, in my next block. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Minister. That concludes the portion of questions for the official opposition. We'll now move on to an independent member. Mr. Barnes, I see, is here for 20 minutes of questions. Would you like to... You can ask if you can go back and forth with the minister or... No, I'd like, like to keep, I'd like to keep a time? block as well. Block time, okay. Go ahead, you have 20 minutes, sir. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, and first of all, thank you to the minister and thanks to all your staff for all the work you do for Cypress Medicine Hat and Albertans. It is greatly appreciated. Um, page 11, outcome number one but the inflation and affordability crisis is a primary challenge facing Albertans today. Absolutely it is. Uh, the number of phone calls to my constituency office concerned about inflation, affordability, and utilities, it, it's, it's, it's disturbing, uh, it, it's, it's voluminous, and uh, so I want to spend lots of time, time talking about that. Uh, particularly insurance. There's a lot of concerns about, about insurance as well. Not only automobile, also property. Um, harder and harder to get and costs have skyrocketed. So, so I wonder, Minister Jones, if that's on your, on your radar as well. Um, and it's absolutely crystal clear is that the wage growth, especially after, after hardworking Albertans pay their, their income tax, wage growth has not kept up with the cost of living. I want to start by asking, has your ministry ever done any freedom of information requests uh, or to see exactly where Albertans are at? I, I disturbingly heard a year ago that possibly 30-35% of Albertans were behind in their utility bills. And uh, I wondered if you have, have ever done any checks on that. And, uh, and of course we know that food bank usage has, has gone through the roof. I'm, I'm wondering about municipalities and their property tax collection just from from you know everyday Albertans. I'm wondering if you've done any 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 mar any measuring of that. Fuel tax relief. I want to take uh, my hat off to your government for doing that. Absolutely, that has helped Alberta families. Um, absolutely, I was in Saskatchewan a week ago when it was a dollar forty-seven compared to a dollar fifteen in Medicine Hat. And you know, you know what I like about it? Like retroactively restoring the indexation for inflation on the tax brackets, it's there for all Albertans to, to take advantage of. Um, Minister Jones, I agree with the MLA from Calgary Mountain View that the condo owners and big complexes like that not being treated equally has caused a problem. And, and I know it's been a year now and, and my constituency office has had a, has had a number have calls and complaints about the unfairness of this and of course a lot of a lot of the people in con condos are, are semi-retired or retired people where affordability is a, a concern especially with this high inflation I appreciate you saying that you're working on it you've looked into it but uh, I would suggest to you that it that it's fairly fairly important to uh, fairly important to get that solution soon I was a little concerned when I saw on performance metrics 1B, uh, your, your ministry has Alberta's annual inflation rate, including its components, food, energy, and shelter, while out of Alberta's control, demonstrates the nature and extent of affordability challenges facing Albertans. The phrase, while well, out of Alberta's control, kind of concerned me a bit. Um, I have a couple quotes from... Uh, from uh, November, when uh, when some of the money to households was advanced, but Travis Shaw, the senior vice president of public finance at DBRS Morningstar, said, 
giving money to households is likely to contribute to the problem, the problem being inflation, as opposed to solving it. Um, Desjardins principal economist Mark Desomero said, there's a risk that households that receive the money simply spend it and that contributes to demand and exacerbates inflation. Um, so, so again, my concern, like when the fuel tax cut was so broadly successful, and especially with the fuel tax cut, where I understand that in, in Ottawa, the inquiry on grocery profits, a uh, big part of the defence is the number one cost increase is the carbon tax on transportation, is the, is the fact that we're a, you know, just-in-time distribution system. And uh, again, I, 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 so, I so advocate for, for, for lower taxes, you know, as, as opposed to, to that. And, and Minister Jones, you need to know that, that I've received a lot of complaints too about those that weren't included in the affordability because of their family status as, as opposed to their income status. And, uh, you know, picking, picking winners and losers always hurts our culture, I think. Um, so I think what is in Alberta's control is increasing competition. And I appreciate your, your one ministry uh, of many, one ministry in a, in a big government. But I also understand that in the insurance industry, there's been quite a bit of consolidation recently where one or two insurance companies, automobile and property, have bought out several of their smaller competitors. Um, well, that would only lead to higher prices. That would only lead to less options for Albertans. Um, so I wonder, I wonder what your industry can do to actually enhance competition. And it's one of the reasons that I've been a main advocate for ending the 2% small business tax, which, which I know is, is finance and treasury board. Uh, it seems to have paid dividends in, in Saskatchewan. And Minister, I wonder when it comes to what is in your control, and I know that the red tape and regulation uh, reduction is a cross-ministry thing, I wonder if you can identify for me one, two, or three areas that reducing red tape has actually made life more affordable. Um, my goodness, we, we're facing a housing crisis where because of inflation, because of raising, rising interest rates, Homes are, are less affordable than ever. Uh, I still believe that land titles could be as many as, as four months in, er, in, in arrears of getting things done, which, which is the cost of title insurance is, is hugely coming, you know, a huge uh, detriment to Albertans. And uh, I heard the other day about uh, annual reviews for our small companies are actually more cumbersome now than they were before the red tape and regulation reduction. So, so if you could just give me one, two, or three instances where reducing red tape and, and re regulation has worked and made life more affordable for, for Albertans, I would, I would appreciate it. Utilities. I get a lot of calls about utilities. Breaks my heart that a lady called me the other day and her utility roof was, her utility bill was triple what it normally is. Large parts of that were transmission, generation, and carbon tax, and she's about to close her business. So, so I wonder when it comes to transmission. We know, we know the PC government from 10 years ago put in a, uh, I think it was, it was Bill 10 actually, um, two transmission lines that, that all Albertans are now paying for. On, on our, our utility bills, and I wonder, I believe they were guaranteed a nine or a nine and a half percent return for that, and that was set at the time when interest rates in the competitive market were three or four. Now that interest rates are considerably higher, I'm wondering if Albertans are gonna face even more hardship. I wonder, I wonder if there's a mechanism where that will go higher. Can you assure us that uh, at the very least that, that won't get any worse? But when it comes to when it comes to transmission costs and the carbon tax that our, our industries pay in, in, in tier one carbon tax and we all pay with our irrigated farmers and, and our small business, I wonder if there's a way that that carbon tax 
can be actually redistributed to reduce that transmission cost in some way to truly make, make life more affordable for, for Alberta families. Um, and again, I, you know, the number of calls I've got, the number of people that have brought their utility bills into my, to my office, where the ancillary charges, the distribution, the extra fees are, are, are more than the generation costs. So, uh, so, so I believe at this point that, that the part of Alberta's uh, utilities for generation is, is working well, but the rest of it isn't and, it, and is unaffordable for, uh, for Albertans. Um, okay. And in the last uh, seconds that I've got left, uh, again, the, on page 14 of your business plan, under statement of operations revenue investment income, I see it has increased from fifty thousand to now four hundred thousand, and your uh, other revenues increased from thir there's an increase from thirteen million in budget two thousand three. Thank you, member. Uh, Minister, you now have ten minutes to respond to the independent member, and then we'll be taking a quick five minute break right after that. So go ahead, sir. Understood. Thank you for the questions, and once again, fully agree. Uh, that affordability is the, is the number one challenge facing Albertans. And that's why we've come forward with uh, what I believe is such a comprehensive uh, suite of measures designed to immediately and over the long term provide affordability supports to Albertans. Um, again, insurance, um, the best uh, avenue for you to get the answers related to insurance would be Treasury Board and Finance. But I can tell you that we are looking at both auto and property, for example. We want to ensure that Albertans have access to affordable insurance uh, that meets their needs. Um, you had touched on uh, food bank usage. Um, those stats would be um, best found in seniors, community, and social services. But I can tell you that when we were when we were working on the food bank uh, supports, um, every food bank that we met with uh, reported that they were seeing substantial increases in utilization, whether it be 20, 30, 50 percent, and they also uh, indicated to, to, to me that uh, they were seeing a higher proportion of, of families, which again is, is one of the reasons that we ensured that families uh, were included in the additional targeted relief uh, so that families with dependent children uh, could have access to nutritious food. Um, you asked a question about FOIP requests. No, uh, the answer is no to that one. Um, and then you also asked, uh, the member opposite, sorry, had asked about uh, how many Albertans are behind on their bills. What I'd like to do here is just invite Chris Hunt from the Utilities Consumer Advocate, um, uh, who plays in this space, uh, to just come and comment on the, the role mandate of the Utilities Consumer Advocate. And if you have any, uh, because you, uh, the Utilities Consumer Advocate does uh, work with uh, consumers and providers to reconnect disconnected customers, um, maybe, I'm hoping that Chris would have some insight into that particular question. Thank you, Minister. Um, I'm Chris Hunt. I'm Executive Director of the Office of the Utilities Consumer Advocate. We run a program each year called the Winter Utilities Reconnection Program. So in October, we'll have each of the utility retailers will send us a list of files. Uh, the last few years, that's typically been around uh, 2,500 uh, files where the retailers themselves have been unable to connect with those customers uh, via mail or phone uh, to come up with a payment plan. And so what we'll do is we'll reach out to each of those customers because quite frequently um, when a customer sees it is a organization that they owe money to, they don't want to answer the phone. So when they see it's from Utilities Consumer Advocate, um, they are, they're more likely to respond. Uh, in particular, we'll mail out letters to each of these customers based off the address information provided by retailers. And um, we'll get responses back from them because we have our contact information and offer to connect them with a mediation officer who can work with them and act as a go-between with the utility company to work out a payment plan to help get them reconnected and uh, and to confirm what their status is. Out of those 2,000 to 2,500 files that we'll uh, typically receive, quite often um, 
there's only a few hundred that are actually in a state of outright disconnection. We have a lot of people that have moved and didn't update their account information with utility companies. We have other people that uh, may have a, a rural recreational property and are disconnected during the winter and are fine with that. Uh, but typically over the last few years, we've been able to help over um, 100 customers each year. And the team is really that last safety net to ensure that if a customer is disconnected and doesn't know what to do, that there's services there that can help them out. And so once we've uh, worked with that customer, we'll also uh, connect them to other community organizations and social supports and government that can help them access emergency funding uh, that will allow them to pay a utility bill up to the point of allowing them to be reconnected. Thank you very much. Uh, the member opposite, um, oh, sorry, the member uh, also uh, commented on our fuel tax relief program, and I just wanted to add uh, because there's been some uh, information uh, to the contrary, but I want to confirm that the fuel tax relief program is permanent. So after June, uh, it will return, it will um, be phased in based on oil price triggers. So essentially in Alberta, when oil prices are high, the fuel tax will be low, starting at $80 and fully phasing out. Uh, the 13 cent per liter fuel tax when oil is above $90. Um, I agree with the member that this is providing significant affordability relief to Albertans. Uh, I also agree with the member on the, uh, the uh, impact of uh, retroactively indexing income tax. Uh, that is, again, one of our broad-based measures available to all Albertans. In fact, 40% of Albertans uh, do not pay Alberta income tax. It's one of the many ways that we are keeping Alberta affordable for low-income Albertans. And these are all things that we had to factor in when we were designing our affordability action plan. Um, it's important to note that these measures are just that. They are an affordability, a suite of affordability measures to combat an inflationary crisis. The existing supports are all still available. These, the supports that Alberta had in place, like the temporary rent benefit, the, the Alberta adult health benefit, most government support programs, federally and provincially, are for low-income Albertans. It's actually, we saw uh, uh, very few supports for middle-income Albertans. And so we wanted to ensure that the affordability payments in particular were available to all low and middle, uh, low and the middle class Albertans. And at the current threshold, which is the same as the federal provincial child care threshold, we included 80% of Alberta families. We excluded the top 20% uh, earning families. Other provinces uh, provided their affordability payments to everybody, including the top 20% most wealthy. Uh, we did not do that here. We felt that we should target it to all low and middle income Alberta families. And, uh, and again, our broad-based relief is significant. It is more significant than what most provinces offered in their whole affordability programs. So uh, an average household in Alberta, just from the uh, uh, electricity rebates, the fuel tax relief and some of the other measures that I mentioned earlier is estimated to benefit uh, to, to the degree of $900 or more. Uh, so significant relief. Um, on the electricity rebates, uh, the member had asked about sub-metering and single-metered uh, customers not receiving the rebates. And again, um, the rebates were applied directly to Albertans bills. And in, in cases of sub-metering or single metering, we do not have a bill to an Albertan to apply it to. Um, but we are exploring uh, op options and ways to get electricity rebates to Albertans behind sub and single meters. Um, there are some complexities to that, which we are working to overcome. Again, I don't want to jeopardize uh, the not-for-profit tax status of condo associations. I don't want to provide a benefit that is taxable for one Albertan and non-taxable to another. Um, so we, but we, certainly, uh, we provided the most significant affordability supports in the country and I would like to get electricity rebates to as many Albertans as possible. And my department is still working on that. Uh, the member commented on, uh, and rightly so, about government spending and how it may or may not impact inflation. And uh, leading economists have looked at this, in, including in Alberta, and Alberta spending is, is not significant enough uh, to materially impact inflation. In fact, uh, inflation has eased more in Alberta than uh, neighboring jurisdictions, other provinces, 
and economists have pointed out that it's actually uh, a, attributable to our affordability measures. Namely, we have made uh, electricity less expensive, uh, and uh, our fuel tax relief has also had an impact. So um, certainly, um, I agree with the member uh, on uh, the, the fuel tax relief program being an ideal way to help Albertans because you're, you're removing a tax um, and thus not contributing to, to inflation through excess government spending. Um, I already touched on this, but the member uh, commented on uh, people not eligible for affordability payments, and that goes back to the broad-based relief. So, and, and there's more that I didn't include, but you've got uh, electricity rebates, natural gas price protection, you know, we've, we've frozen auto insurance rates, we've provided uh, broad pro-secondary affordability measures. Um, so, and again, uh, an average household in Alberta who's not receiving the targeted supports. So again, a household without seniors, without dependent children, without Albertans on core support programs, is estimated to benefit uh, to up to $900 or more over this period. Um, and uh, that is significant relief. Uh, Thank you very uh, much, Minister. We will now take a quick five minute break followed by a 20 minute block for the government caucus.
Thank you very much, members. We'll now move on to a 20-minute block for the Government Caucus. Uh, Mr. Getson, you have the floor You're going back and forth or block time? I'll leave it to the discretion of the Minister, but I'd love to go back and forth if we could. Yes. For, thank you, Minister. And uh, first of all, thank you very much for such outstanding work in this file. Uh, the questions that I'm going to have for you today, sir, are uh, predominantly around page one or page 11 and page 12, pardon me. But I know that out in my constituency, um, you know, I knew some, use some phraseology as simply as what matters to you. And I know that you do a similar approach in your area. And I think what we're talking about the affordability file here, and hats off again to your department working across ministries, because it resonates not only with the folks in my area that, um, you know, say that they're rural predominantly, but also for the folks that are more urban setting as well. And the other thing that I get comments back on that is that it wasn't just a throw spaghetti at the wall type function. Uh, it was timely, strategic, and uh, getting to getting folks in a manner that really mattered and helped them. The other thing that came back too is a lot of folks were cognizant of uh, the other challenges and the issues out in the area. Again, uh, M. Ellie Smith and I, we share the, the two big power generating uh, plants out here. So folks in our area understand where the driving costs of the electricity were and some of the phase out and the carbon tax and everything else and how it hits and on the distribution file as well as the, the um, uh, transmission files. And the REAs, of course, are, are no uh, uh, novices when it comes to the pool itself and how it's being affected. So with that, I really appreciate all the work that you guys have done. I also appreciate the extra time that you've taken in your department over the last little bit to help us unravel some of the complexities of this file. And uh, the way I kind of put it to my constituents was your team is way smarter at this than I could ever hope to be because when I looked at the original file, it was kind of like old Clark Griswold out there trying to do his electrical wiring for his Christmas tree lights. It's pretty complex. So you came up with an elegant solution that was that was very tactile uh, to be able to get it out in hand. So credit to you and your team. So Minister, I'd like to kick off if I could uh, on the topic uh, that's going to address the affordability. So key page or key objective 1.1 on the page 11 of the business plan states the ministry will lead, facilitate, and coordinate the government's effort to address Albertans' cost of living concerns. And I know that top of, uh, or affordability is obviously top of mind right now. So first part of the question, sir, is how does your ministry provide this leadership within the government of Alberta, and what are some of your key areas of focus in 23-24? Yeah, thank you to the member for the question. Uh, my, mem my ministry has led Alberta's response to affordability by developing and coordinating the implementation of Alberta's Affordability Action Plan. Our plan provides both broad-based and targeted supports to help Albertans with inflation and the associated rising cost of living. Initiatives that form part of our plan are included in Budget 2023, which forecasts $2.3 billion in affordability-related expenditures in 2023-24, and programs to reduce energy and utility costs have directly contributed to a lower rate of inflation in Alberta compared to other provinces and have broad benefits uh, to consumers and businesses. Fuel tax relief has lowered input costs for businesses, who can then pass these lower costs on to consumers. Further, this relief in ensures that Albertans struggling with cost of living do not need to worry as much, much about the cost of commuting or, for example, taking their kids to activities. Similarly, el electricity rebates have helped the vast majority of Albertans with higher electricity prices. Resuming the indexation of social programs and the provincial personal income tax system is also assisting all Albertans. These initiatives are supplemented by supports targeted at particular groups. Um, for example, the total of up to $600 in affordability payments made available for each senior and each dependent child in households uh, with incomes under 180000 who face particular pressure under inflation. The same $600 payments to recipients of government support such as AISH, income support, uh, people receiving uh, services under PDD, the Alberta Seniors Benefit, the Alberta Child Benefit, uh, ensure that vulnerable Albertans are not left behind. This is a huge affordability support for families and will ensure that parents can return to the workplace sooner, boosting their income and supporting Alberta's economy. Low-income transit passes and our support to food banks provide further assistance to vulnerable and low-income Albertans. Grocery prices, we know, have been a major issue for Albertans, and the additional, additional support through the affordability payments, through the savings, through our fuel tax relief program, will certainly help. And for our most vulnerable, 
our contributions to food banks will ensure that the lowest income Albertans, the most vulnerable, will also have access to food. Low income transit support uh, ensures that even more Albertans can afford transportation for work and daily living. Our, our government has also heard loud and clear that Albertans have concerns uh, with cost increases for specific essential services. We have taken decisive action to control auto insurance rates by limiting rate increases until January 2024. We will continue to monitor affordability challenges this coming year. The budget forecasts inflation to ease, but we still see pressure in particular areas, notably for food. That is why we've ensured that the most significant supports, the affordability payments and the full fuel tax continue until June 30th, giving us time to assess and respond to the inflation and cost of living situation at that time. Albertans will continue to be protected by ongoing uh, protection measures such as the permanent natural gas and fuel tax relief based on oil price triggers. And indexation of provincial income tax and social benefit programs will also provide longer term support to all Albertans and our most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for that fulsome answer. And, and I guess just to put it in, uh, in layman's terms here, again, with the business plan, if we were looking at a typical family of four, I know you're a family man as well. Um, you know, I think you're an overachiever. You've got more than a typical family of four, similar to myself. But uh, can you outline what the affordability supports? Um, how would that would impact them, in a typical family of four? How are, how are real everyday Albertans going to be impacted by this? Yeah, great question. So uh, taking the current month, we can point uh, to the range of ways a family will benefit. First, for two dependent children, the family will receive $200 per month in affordability supports for a total of $1,200 tax-free. These payments are tax-free. They, they also don't impact any eligibility for uh, other support programs. Uh, they'll receive $1,200 from January to June. Second, each time the family fills, fills up their vehicle, they will receive ongoing relief through our fuel tax. And for the purposes of this example, uh, let's assume the family fills up their Jeep Grand Cherokee weekly. They'd be saying, saving uh, $50 a month in fuel taxes alone. That would be uh, $300 in fuel tax savings from January to June on top of the $1,200 in tax-free affordability payments. What's more, they are protected from rate increases uh, to the insurance on that vehicle through our pause on auto insurance rate increases. Assuming both parents work and the children are in full-time daycare, the family may be saving as much as $1,200 a month through our, our affordability, affordable child care supports. This agreement uh, with the federal government means that Alberta's unique child care system is supported to provide lower cost and high quality care to parents. Uh, when the family receives their electricity bill in March, they will find a $25 rebate to assist with rising power prices. This is in addition to the uh, $50 rebates on their bills received from July to December 2022 and the $75 rebates in January and February in 2023. Finally, when they receive their paychecks, the provincial income tax withheld will be lower as a result of the indexation of our personal income tax. This means more money in their pockets to spend on household essentials. Excluding the changes to auto insurance and the tax indexation, the family would be $1,400 and $75 uh, $1,475 better off in the month of March uh, than they would have been in the absence of our uh, government supports. You also asked about the income threshold for affordability payments. This threshold was uh, chosen to mirror the income threshold used to determine eligibility for the child care subsidy. And this supports consistency, consistency and can be seen as a reasonable benchmark for middle income Alberta families. Our intention with the program was to support low, all low and middle income Albertan families that have been impacted by inflation. And uh, as I mentioned previously, at this threshold, this includes 80% of Alberta families, all low and middle income. We excluded the top 20% uh, most wealthy. Thank you. Yeah, and with that, Minister, if I may, again, uh, you kind of transitioned into a bit of the inflationary item there. So again, that's kind of mentioned on page one or on the first item on page 11 of the business plan. Would you mind speaking a little bit more about uh, the significant drives of cost of inflation um, and what you're doing to do to address those? So in specific, sir, uh, would the minister provide an overview of the impacts on inflation of the cost of living trends facing Albertans? And the second part is, has any of the work undertaken by this ministry had an impact on reducing inflation? So both how you're going to address it and if we had any metrics on the back end to see if it's effective. 
Thank you for the question. So overall, consumer inflation has receded somewhat in recent month, months, but remains elevated. In Alberta, inflation, which is measured as the year-over-year -year growth in the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, was 5% in January 2023. While this is a moderation from the 8.4% high we saw in June of last year, it is still elevated compared to historical norms. The 5% rate in January compared to the national rate of 6% uh, is, is, our rate of 5% is lower than, than what you're seeing across Canada. Interestingly, a key driver of the lower rate of inflation in Alberta compared to other parts of Canada is our affordability program. Statistics Canada reported that Alberta inflation rate was down largely in part due to falling energy prices for consumers, which was supported by the electricity rebate program and our fuel tax relief program. And uh, Statistics Canada had this to say, electricity prices in Alberta fell 45.6% in January compared with December, the largest monthly decline on record. The decline follows a provincial initiative to reduce electricity rates and increase the provincial electricity rebate. Alberta was the only province with a year-over-year -year decline in gasoline prices, minus 6.4%. This reflects uh, the complete suspension of the provincial gas tax starting uh, January 1st, and of course that runs until June 30th and then returns uh, based on oil price triggers. In January, among the provinces, Alberta had the lowest rate of inflation in Canada. According to St Statistics Canada, this was directly attributable, again, to our Affordability Action Plan. Budget 2023 forecasts inflation to continue to ease, averaging 3.3% uh, next year. This is still above the target pursued by the Bank of Canada. And inflation has become more broad-based in, re in recent months, as many components have seen significant increases. Food, shelter, and energy are presently the main contributors to Alberta's headline consumer inflation increases in October 2022. Food inflation accounted for over one quarter of Alberta's overall inflation, followed by shelter inflation, excluding natural gas and electricity, which contributed uh, 27%. Food inflation, I should have mentioned, is, is 28% of the contribution to inflation. And energy uh, contributed 13.6%. All other goods and services accounted for the remaining 44.3% uh, of inflationary increases. Two areas where we continue to have concerns in the inflation data are food and shelter. Food inflation remained elevated in Alberta uh, in January, seeing a small increase due to prices of beef and chicken. And food inflation accelerated in January to 10.5%, close to a 40-year high. High interest rates are increasing housing costs for consumers, uh, for example, uh, through increased costs of servicing a loan and in turn rental costs that are passed on to renters, and also contributing to ongoing price inflation for services. Uh, price inflation in these specific areas are things we will continue to monitor, uh, but some of our responses, such as our, our support for food banks, fuel tax relief, our affordability payments, are specifically targeted to support Albertans with these price increases. Ongoing inflation in specific areas means that Albertans, uh, particularly those on low and fixed incomes, are facing challenges and struggling to pay for daily necessities like heat, transportation, and food. However, what is also clear is that our government has taken action that is actually lowering uh, pressure on families and the inflation rate in this province. Um, thank you. And, and Minister, we know that uh, in Alberta here, at least with the last two budgets that came out, they definitely don't balance themselves. We know that. Mm -hmm. We know that uh, a lot of these inflationary problems that we're having right now were created by others, by ideological type policies that put in place, inclusive of the carbon tax, premature phase out of coal, you overbuild the transmission systems, a ton of things that we've inherited now, quite frankly, all the chickens have come home to roost on it. So with that, can you talk a little bit about uh, the inflationary pressures as it relates to, to energy? Uh, performance indicator on 1B on page 11 of the business plan breaks down the rate of inflation for various goods, both in Alberta and across Canada. Uh, you have a metric there between 2018, 21, and 22. The inflation rates were higher in Alberta, or sorry, the inflation uh, regards to the energy rates grows significantly higher. Um, these rates were higher in Alberta than the rest of Canada, even in 22 with the energy prices. It still rose at a similar pace. So a two-part question to that, sir. Uh, as Alberta is Canada's largest producer of energy, why is that the case? What's going on in Alberta here since we sit on all these assets? 
I think we expect the Ministry of Affordability Initiatives to make a meaningful impact in this area. Yeah, thank you for the questions. The inflation rate for energy for consumers is comprised of some prices which are set in inter international markets and others that are set in local markets. For example, prices for oil are set in international markets and have seen significant increases, particularly during uh, 2022. This has been fueled in part by geopolitical uncertainty and the war in Ukraine. The drivers of inflation are quite clearly outside uh, of Alberta's control, well, these ones. Increasing oil prices have enhanced our budget position through increases in royalties, but also contributed to higher gasoline prices for Albertans. An approved budget position has enabled us to take actions that have offset some of the costs for Albertans through our fuel tax relief program. This, in turn, has lowered uh, the measured rate of energy inflation. Prices of other energy sources that comprise the measure uh, of energy inflation are set at a more local level. Electricity prices can vary depending on supply and demand, as well as weather conditions, scheduled or unscheduled maintenance on generators or distribution networks, uh, market behavior by generators, fuel costs such as natural gas, carbon pricing, and events affecting our imports of electricity. It is important to note that electricity rates are based on market conditions, but consumers have a, a wide variety of options to shield themselves from volatility in energy prices. We also recognize the pressures that high natural gas prices can place on Albertans. It is important to note that natural gas rates are based on market fundamentals related to supply and demand. The government does not control natural gas prices. In winter 2022, uh, the increase in natural gas prices reflects the lag between production and increased global demand for energy as economies recovered from COVID-19 and the impacts of Russia's war on Ukraine. There has been a recent decrease, uh, thankfully, in, of natural gas prices, with the Alberta natural gas price at $2.85 in March of 2023. And I believe that, uh, you'd also asked about uh, ministry uh, initiatives to, to impact inflation. Our government's actions to tackle energy inflation have had a meaningful impact, such that in January 2023, we saw the largest monthly fall in electricity prices on record. According to Statistics Canada, and I quote, electricity prices in Alberta fell 45.6% in January compared with December, the largest monthly decline on record. The decline follows a provincial initiative to reduce electricity rates and increase the provincial electricity rebate. Alberta was the only province with a year-over-year -year decline in gasoline prices. Again, that was minus 6.4%, and this reflects the complete suspension of the 13 cent per litre provincial gas tax starting January 1st and, and going until June 30th. You can see here that the impact of our policies for consumers, uh, it, it means lower prices, more flexibility in their finances. What it means is that for the period when our policies have been in place, which has also coincided with the highest prices, our policies have had a clear and demonstrable impact on consumer prices. Further, you mentioned in the first part of your question that we are Canada's largest producer of energy. I would like to point out that it is precisely because we are the largest producer of energy that we have the fiscal room to provide the relief that has directly uh, led to decreased costs for Alberta consumers compared to consumers in other parts of Canada. Thank you. Uh, Minister, if I may, and we're down to a little bit of uh, timing crunch here, so I'll try to rattle this out a little bit quicker. Uh, key objectives 2.2 on page 12 of the business plan state your ministry's intention to serve, ensure a regulated rates for electricity and natural gas are formulated to best serve Albertans. What exactly does this entail and you know, what criteria is the ministry going to use to determine what is best for Albertans? Yeah, great question. In Alberta, most electricity consumers have a choice of energy retail service providers. The regulated rate option, or RRO, is the default option for residential, small business, and farm customers who have chosen not to, or are unable to, sign a competitive contract. Currently, about 39% of residential customers are on the RRO. Some passively stay on it despite uh, the recent high electricity prices, and some are not uh, eligible for competitive contracts due to uh, bad credit or, or a potential lack of credit history. The AUC approves electricity RRO rates for the three major RRO providers in our province, EPCOR, NMAX, and Direct Energy Regulated Services. Municipalities that distribute electricity 
and Rural Electrification Associations, known as REAs, have their RO rates approved by the local municipal council or REA board of directors rather than by the AUC. The City of Medicine Hat is exempt in the Electric Utilities Act from providing an RO rate. Instead, Medicine Hat has chosen to offer a... Oh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Minister, we'll now move to a uh, 10-minute block for the official opposition, and I uh, assume you'll, you still want block time? Yes. So it'll be five minutes and five minutes. So go ahead, uh, Member. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to start by going back over... Actually, I'll go back over questions in a minute. We'll have a few of these, I'm sure. Um, I think the one I want to start with, Minister, is that uh, in response to the minister from uh, from the to the member from Cyprus Medicine Hat, uh, you indicated um, that your decision to include families in the affordability payments was because of increased food bank usage. Um, I'm curious about that because it's my understanding um, that there's been significantly increased food bank usage by students as well. So post-secondary students in particular um, have uh, seen an increased need. And I'm hearing this not only um, from student union who are providing these sorts of information, uh, but my understanding is food banks on campuses have actually seen increased demand and that that's measurable. So I'm, I'm interested to know how much, um, since you appear to be monitoring that, um, how much increased usage there is from students, um, which, I mean, it's not a surprise to me. Uh, in the last four years under this government, tuition has absolutely skyrocketed. Um, so it's not at all a surprise to me that um, students are having these affordability challenges. And I'm a bit curious what your justification in that case is for excluding students from these payments. Um, I mean, students tend to be some of the lowest income people, they tend to have some of the, the, the biggest um, challenges. We're certainly hearing regularly, um, not just from people writing into my office, but from their students union on their behalf, that they are uh, incredibly, incredibly challenged um, in terms of their ability to, to make ends meet, to feed themselves, to pay their tuition. Um, so I'm just, I'm really curious um, why they were excluded from this program. Um, I think returning again to the natural gas program, um, so I, I understand you'd be saying it didn't pay out anything last year um, and that in this upcoming year, so in the year that we're looking at estimates, that it's built into the contingency fund. Um, I'm assuming that the contingency fund is based on a series of calculations as opposed to just being a giant slush fund. Um, so, based on that, I'm just wondering, um, in that calculation, how much do you project to be spent on the natural gas uh, rebate? Uh, since presumably, I mean, I assume that in the contingency, you sort of estimated what the rough cost of things would be and put it in there, as opposed to just having a giant government slush fund to spend on whatever programs you wanted, uh, which would be, well, kind of contrary to the idea of public budgeting. Um, In terms of um, go go forward, so you talked about the fuel tax rebate continuing. So in the estimates, the upcoming, the 23-24 year, what do you project the foregone cost of revenue to be as a result of that fuel tax rebate? Um, because presumably when you did your calculations on, on money coming into the government, um, you, calculated, uh, you calculated how much revenue would be foregone based on, because you have to project oil prices to project revenue anyway, so um, I'm just wondering what the projected cost of that fuel tax rebate will be to Albertans um, in the coming year. Um, and I guess the, the fourth one I'll, I'll go out on this one is, um, I asked a couple of times about, uh, about groceries and sort of what the plan was to sort of convince Albertans that those costs were reasonable um, or that those increases were reasonable in light of, I mean, and again, I'm assuming that all members around the table received the same correspondence from their constituents uh, regarding, um, you know, regarding their concerns about, you know, the sudden surging price of food, especially in light of the fact that that those 
prices aren't generally being passed on or that increased income is not being passed on um, to, to producers. Uh, so I would just be curious, um, in light of the rejection of the all-party committee, uh, to examine that, what, what the other mechanism is, like what public forum uh, do you intend to examine that in? And I think I'll just cede those 15 seconds for the next block. Okay, thank you, Minister. You have five minutes to respond. Yeah, and thank you to the, the member for her questions. Um, I referenced that the, the rise in food bank usage and the observation from uh, food bank operators that children uh, were, one, were also increasingly seen at food banks uh, was concerning. And, but the, the reason that families with dependent children were targeted with the affordability payments is because families uh, spend more on, on home shelter, on, on fuel, on uh, certainly food. And I can tell you that the average family of four uh, paid $1,000 more for groceries last year and could see another $1,000 increase this year. An average family of four in Alberta could pay as much as $16,000 uh, for groceries this year. And again, uh, children in particular uh, had uh, um, a, their well-being was certainly impacted by the pandemic. Their education was impacted. And we wanted to ensure that families had the flexibility, the fi including the financial flexibility, to provide normalcy for children, to keep them in their activities, to get them uh, uh, food and nutritious food. We heard that uh, we saw reports that families were buying less food and less, less nutritious food, and we, and we certainly wanted to ensure that families had the resources to provide uh, the best opportunities for their children. So more mouths to feed, higher users of electricity, fuel, and food, and that's why they were included in the affordability payments. Um, post-secondary, uh, we're committed to ensuring that post-secondary education is accessible and affordable. And we continue to ensure that student aid programs, including repayable student loans, grants, scholarships, awards, and bursaries exist to support a wide range of learners across all forms of post-secondary education. The government recently announced a caps to tuition increases for domestic students at public institutions at 2% at the institution level uh, from the 2024-25 year onwards. We also uh, reduced uh, the interest rate on student loans and we extended the student loan grace period. We doubled it from six months to 12 months to give students more time, more flexibility uh, to find gainful employment and not feel uh, pressured by their student loans. We also increased eligibility for the repayment assistance plan. And this plan helps students manage their student loans. And we thought that that threshold needed to be higher given the rapid increase in interest rates that students and everybody else uh, was contending with. So these measures will ease the impact of inflation so post-secondary students can focus on their education and worry less about paying their bills. I'll also point out that students are eligible for electricity rebates. I know students who certainly appreciate the fuel tax relief on their way to and from school. Um, uh, they also benefit from our changes to income tax, our, our freezing of automobile insurance increases. So uh, we've provided broad-based relief and uh, post-secondary affordab affordability measures to post-secondary students. Under Budget 2023, uh, there's $1.1 billion in Alberta student loans to help an estimated 131,000 students pursue post-secondary education. We've, we've, we're providing $112 million in scholarships and awards. Uh, to approximately 57,000 students and 69 million in grants to 25,000 students. Uh, the member had also uh, asked about uh, the fuel tax relief and how much that, that is expected to cost. Uh, I'm pleased to report that Albertans sh are estimated to save $570 million in fuel tax relief this fiscal year. And, um, and, and again, the, this program started last year. Albertans have already been saving. Uh, at the pumps um, and they will continue to after June 30th but based on oil price triggers and again uh, we of course wanted to support Albertans with cost of living during this inflationary period we all we wanted to ensure that they benefited uh, from the owned resource we continue to evaluate additional ways that we can support both students families and other Albertans uh, with inflation and high cost of living and that includes um, evaluating 
our electricity system to see if the, uh, we're exploring generation, distribution, transmission, all the way down to uh, retail providers to see if we can better use our existing transmission and distribution to prevent further um, builds. And, uh, and we're also looking at the regulated rate option to see if we can get um, uh, that reformed so that it has less volatility, more stability, that it's more affordable for Albertans. And that may include um, uh, supporting Albertans to uh, explore competitive rate options. Uh, Thank you, Minister. We'll now move on to a 10-minute block for the independent member. Mr. Barnes, uh, block time, five minutes for you and five minutes for the minister. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thanks again to the minister and your staff. Uh, six questions that I'd, I'd like to, to ask. First of all, on page 14 of your business plan, 2022 to 2026, under Statement of Operations, you have utility rebate and grant programs. It goes this year from the forecast at $648 million down to 2023-24 to 47 million and of course uh, there was nothing in the budget for it before 648 uh, million was spent last year uh, can you please uh, give me some clarity around why that is and, and those numbers please thank you um, secondly on the department of affordability and utilities on page nine of your business plan uh, bullet number four manages the policy and program supporting the expansion and upgrading of rural utility infrastructure. I'm very glad to see that uh, there's some special recognition for the needs in, in rural utilities uh, from you know the cost of transmission lines needing to be serviced and those kind of things but but what what is your long-term focus with that? Is it to make it more affordable for, for Alberta's small towns that that a lot of them are already burdened by the fact that so many of their deep services and their roads and those kind of things have to, to be redone and uh, how can we have uh, our rural electric associations uh, be fully engaged in, in providing competitive service for all Albertans. I know in the past there's been some bottlenecks in an unlevel playing field between our, our bigger utility companies and REAs. Uh, are you doing anything to address that? Are we doing anything to enhance competition for, for Albertans? Um, appreciate uh, your consumer advocate coming down and, and helping explain the situation. Uh, I would suggest, though, that 2,000 to 2,500 uh, bills that finally get, uh, you know, to where we can't find the the person that owes or, or the homeowner or, or the, the tenant is, is a small part of the, the problem. I want to take a bit of uh, my hat off to the, the people of Medicine Hat, where I hear time and time again when people can't afford their utilities, it's someone like St. Vincent de Paul or the Salvation Army. And even in Medicine Hat, uh, our city had or has a program where if you, if you want to be helpful and charitable, you can actually overpay on your utility bill. And the city of Medicine Hat will decide uh, who needs those services. So again, I, I'm, I just think that, that the answer given doesn't fully explain the full extent of the problem. And, and I think the hardship for people paying utilities, for Albertans paying utilities out, out there, is extreme now. Um, I want to touch on, on housing affordability. Interest rates have gone up by three or four times and it looks like some of our, our, our bigger city uh, markets are still very, very strong. Uh, Minister, this is going to make housing affordability for our youth uh, next to impossible. Uh, I wonder if, if there's anything on your, your radar at all long term. I asked you in the last uh, the last group of questions, just give me one, two, or three examples of where red tape has been reduced to make life more affordable for Albertans. I know it's not directly your, your responsibility, but that is a, a cross-ministry uh, ministry situation, and, and I would just like to, to know where, where we've actually been effective on, on reducing red tape. I also asked it uh, last time about the ongoing cost of transmission lines. I understand that uh, the big builders and the big providers of, of those lines were guaranteed somewhere between a 9 and a 9.5% interest rate, and that's when the going bank rate might have been 2 or 3. Now that that bank rate has doubled or tripled, my goodness, are Albertans going to have to pay more? Um, is, and is there a way to uh, 
renegotiate the cost of these lines. I mean, we've seen uh, renewables explode throughout the, around the province, and of course, they, they may be the main beneficiary of these lines. It's, it's allowed them to hook into the utility grid with a lot less cost. Maybe there's a way to, to have some of those companies pay some of this cost rather than that Alberta family raising three kids, trying to pay for utilities, food, and, and send three kids to, to university or trade school. Um, and I'll just close again. Uh, the number of people that have come to my office and, and talked about shutting down their business, talked about the stress they're feeling because of the federal carbon tax. Uh, is there any way to redirect our tier one carbon tax to, to help these Alberta families? Is there anything we can do to get those extra ancillary and distribution charges off the backs of Alberta families? Thank you. Thank you, Minister. You have five minutes to respond. Uh, and thank you to the member for the question. So, yeah, I wanted to get to red tape reduction, and I'm, I'm pleased to report that Affordability Utilities has taken significant action to reduce red tape and we've already re achieved our red tape reduction target. Uh, the ministry has reduced its regulatory count by 37.5 percent exceeding the government of Alberta target of 33 percent. The reductions made are already creating cost savings for industry. To date uh, affordability utilities and its agencies have saved industry an estimated 125 million dollars. We've made substantial progress in addressing uh, industry concerns about regulatory burdens and we're committed to working together to make further improvements. The government continues to participate in industry panels that provide direct input into red tape reduction initiatives, and, and we appreciate the red tape reduction submissions we've received from both the industry panel and the public. Uh, my favorite uh, red tape reduction initiative um, was the digitization of Alberta registries uh, so that Albertans can do driver's licenses and plates online. That was a significant cost savings to government Albertans and, and more importantly, probably a, a significant time savings. So that's the specific example that I would highlight. In addition to the, uh, the work of the ministry and the $125 million in estimated savings, um, I'm going to turn it over to Matt to comment on the business plan and the statement of operations. Thank you, Minister. So you had asked about the $648 million in the 22-23 forecast and going down to $47.5 million in the estimate. So you're right, that is for the utility rebate and grant programs. Um, the $648 million represents the uh, six months of payments from October to March period. Um, that's $635 million for that program, which includes the $9.5 million for the administration that uh, the Minister had referenced earlier. In addition to this, what's included that is the $12.5 million for the foregone interest to the regulated rate option providers that uh, is, is being saved, uh, being passed on to consumers. So that's what makes up the 648. And what you see for the $47.5 million is just the final month of uh, electricity rebate payments in the month of April, going to the nearly $2 million uh, to residences, homes, and, uh, and businesses and farms. So uh, it, it's concluding with that final month in, in April. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we, we administer three programs to support uh, rural Alberta in meeting their utility needs. Um, the first is the Rural Electric Program. Um, so that assists individuals in providing uh, electric services to areas with low population densities that are, that are otherwise uneconomical to serve at a level consistent with higher densities, uh, density areas in Alberta. The program grant supports the construction of distribution services and or the upgrading and modernization of aging infrastructure throughout rural Alberta. Uh, affordability and Utilities is committed to ensuring rural Albertans have access to an efficient and modern utility distribution system that is safe, reliable, resilient, and environmentally responsible. Annual core funding of $700,000 for the Rural Electric Program grant is being maintained through to 2025. This grant is administered by the Alber Alberta Federation of Rural Electrification Associations on behalf of the Ministry of Affordability and Utilities. The Alberta Federation of Rural Elec Electrification Associations, or AFRIA, and its members continue to have an important role in building and maintaining a strong and prosperous rural Alberta. <laughs> the second one, uh, the Rural Gas Program. So we are increasing support for the Rural Gas Program grant, which assists distributors or individuals in providing gas services to areas with low population densities that are otherwise uneconomical to serve at a level consistent with higher density areas in Alberta. Program grants support the construction of dis distribution services and or the upgrading and the modernization of aging infrastructure throughout rural Alberta. Afforded, um, funding for the Rural Gas Program grant 
is being increased from previous years to assist in addressing the chronic oversubscription of this program, which I'm sure you've heard about, driven by consumer demand. Annual core funding for the rural gas program is $5.7 million and is being maintained through to 2025. This grant funding supports uh, rural construction by the Federation members, uh, ACCO Gas and Pipelines Limited, and Apex Utilities. We also have the Remote Area Heating Allowance, or RAHA, the best acronym in the business. The Remote Area Heating Allowance program improves affordability to rural Albertans by reducing the cost of propane and heating oil in locations that cannot be economically served by a local natural gas distributor through the existing natural gas infrastructure. Annually, upwards of 1.5 million rebates are provided, um, and it looks like we're out of time. Uh, thank you, Minister. We'll now move on to a 10-minute block for the Government Caucus. Are you going back and forth or block time? Back and forth, Go ahead, okay. Mr. Turk. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Minister, for coming out here tonight and providing information to uh, the huge crowd of individuals watching us here online. And also a huge thanks to all, your, all of your staff, the ones here at the table as well as the ones at the back. So thank you very much for the work that you do for Albertans. So a couple of questions. I, I know uh, you touched base a little bit about the affordability grants um, but I, uh, and the supports, but... Uh, I want to kind of touch base on a couple groups um, that haven't really been highlighted. Um, you know, as I've said many times in, here in my riding in Spruce Grove, Stony Plain, it, it continues to have one of the lowest average uh, average age population groups in the entire province. I think in Spruce Grove, the average age is about 30, uh, 32, and Stony Plain is about 34. And everywhere you look out th uh, throughout my riding, there's, there's kids, it seems like, everywhere. And I know a key part of your package, Minister, uh, putting forth was um, putting forth a package that really helped target those Alberta households with children. And so I, I know when I'm out uh, visiting with my constituents here in my area, um, the r financial relief that the government of Alberta has provided to families with kids has, has been extensive. Uh, first of all, I guess I was just hoping if you could elaborate a little bit specifically on on the focus that the government has on families with children and how we've been able to support them. Yeah, thank you. So uh, as part of our affordability action plan, uh, the government has, has provided significant relief, both broad-based and targeted to families. So as part of that plan, uh, so far we've, we've extended the fuel tax relief for at least the next six months. Uh, we've expanded electricity rebates to, to provide households a total of up to $500 in electricity rebates. We've provided better protection against future electricity and natural gas price spikes. And uh, we've also resumed the indexation of Alberta's core support programs, including uh, AISH, the Assured Income for the Severely Handicapped, um, Income Support, the Alberta Seniors Be Benefit, and the Alberta Child and Family Benefit. Uh, as the member was alluding to, we've provided additional targeted payments totaling up to $600 per child uh, to families in Alberta. These are the same affordability payments that uh, seniors 65 and up and Albertans on core support programs are also eligible for. Um, we've also provided um, uh, additional support in, in, in terms of post-secondary. Uh, we've frozen auto insurance rate increases and uh, if, you, if you add up the estimated benefit for the broad-based measures for a family that would be $900, and that is mainly the electricity rebates, up to $500, and fuel tax savings, uh, up $200 per car, $400 mid-sized vehicle, up, upwards of $600 for trucks, depending on what you drive and how often. So broad-based measures alone for households, for families, up to $900 or more. And then depending on the number of uh, children they have, that's $600 per child over the next six months. Again, uh, economists have estimated the additional cost burden that excess inflation uh, places on families and it was estimated at $90 a month so it was our intention to ensure that children didn't pay the price of excess inflation. We wanted to provide families with the flexibility um, to really support the health and well-being of their children. We wanted kids to focus on being kids and uh, I think that's really important after the, the couple of years uh, we saw there during the pandemic. So overall, our package of measures sought to ensure an appropriate balance of broad-based supports, which are available to the vast majority of Albertans, along with additional targeted supports to groups like families, seniors, and of course, our most vulnerable. Thank you.
And no, thank you very much for that, Minister. I know when I go to the local leisure center, um, you know, and chatting with parents, I, I know I've, uh, you know, my wife and I have coached soccer, and you always in, in um, conversations with families and parents, um, and, and I know the affordability payments constantly comes up as, as, uh, as uh, a valued type of uh, uh, support for families in our area. So for that, thank you. Uh, before I kind of continue that line of questions, I, I do want to ask a couple of questions about uh, an issue that is very focused on my riding, and that actually has to do with electricity as well as coal. And, uh, you know, I guess the first question I have is, you know, it has to do with the phase out of coal power generation in Alberta. Uh, I know that there is uh, always this question about carbon intensity. So I guess I was just wondering if you can maybe elaborate, Minister, on other ways that uh, electricity generators are able to reduce that intensity so that, you know, it could be better off for the environment. Yeah, th thank you very much. So, as noted, based on, on current plans, all Alberta coal-fired generation will be phased out by the end of 2023, much sooner uh, than federally mandated in, in 2030. This is due in part to the uh, powerful economic incentives um, through our technology innovation and emissions reduction regulation. Carbon pricing and corporate interest in environmental, social, and governance goals have created strong market-based incentives for additional investment in zero and low carbon intensity generation capacity. Uh, Alberta has partnered with other provinces to support the development of uh, small modu modular nuclear reactors or SMR technology in Canada and Albertans will certainly have the opportunity to comment on any potential projects through that engagement process. But the core of your question is, uh, like you, uh, uh, sorry, like the member uh, and all of us, we, we constantly hear from our constituents about um, electricity. We constantly hear about the affordability challenges that families and Albertans are facing. And, and again, that's why we came forward with affordability, affordability measures that directly targeted uh, both electricity and, and also the other areas that Albertans were seeing cost increases. So uh, we, we started off with the fuel tax relief, 13 cents per litre on every liter of gas and diesel, which is in effect until June of this year. Uh, we continued our electricity rebate program to provide up to $500 in electricity relief until April 2023. This month's rebate is $25. We've also done other things. We've continued our investment into affordable child care. That's another thing that I'm sure uh, comes up in the members' constituency. And, and this is significant. This is, uh, this is saving families that utilize child care. Uh, between four and four hundred dollars and six hundred and fifty dollars a month, and that's going to continue. The savings are going to continue to increase. Uh, the cost of child care is going to continue to de decrease um, towards 25, uh, 2025 26, uh, which where we're targeting an average of ten dollars a day. Uh, we've also made permanent changes to our, our core support programs uh, so that the, the Albertans that, that we, we constantly uh, discuss. Uh, their programs with, uh, whether it be age or, or income support, we want to make sure they're calibrated correctly, but I'm pleased to report that they're now uh, indexed. They will uh, continue to increase with inflation to ensure that Albertans uh, who need that support will continue uh, to receive it. And um, we also retroactively uh, indexed uh, income taxes so that all Albertans uh, would uh, pay less tax come tax time or receive a higher rebate and, and have lower withholdings on their on their checks moving forward, which is critically important at a time of excess inflation and uh, increased cost of living. I am pleased to report, though, that, Al that Alberta, uh, and the member opposite knows this well, Alberta does have the highest weekly earnings. We have the lowest taxes. We've got a booming job market with 100,000 vacancies. So that's probably uh, uh, worthy of an affordability measure mentioned in itself because we know that the best way to enable people uh, to afford uh, cost of living is, is for them to have meaningful employment. And I'd like to thank the member opposite for his efforts in, in creating an environment that does just that. Um, we are back to electricity. I'm very pleased to say that Alberta is projected to be the national leader in, in future renewable uh, generation. We are the destination, and that's where the majority of uh, future uh, green uh, projects are being built. And, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, that description there, Minister. And, and um, you know, just to kind of continue on the key objective 2.1 and the performance indicator 2B, it really talks about the accelerated coal phase-out 
um, that uh, you know you kind of alluded to that we're expected to reach by 2030. And I'm, I'm also pleased to know that many of the uh, workers uh, that you talked about with the highest um, uh, weekly earnings uh, continues to be the case here in Alberta. I, I will say, you know, there was a for, for many workers that were uh, put out of work in my riding uh, due to the previous government's accelerated coal phase out. Um, maybe they were not able to experience those high wages, uh, many of which had to go to BC to work. But it's nice to know that at least for some of them, they've been able to transition into other lines of work. But I know that economic pain in my riding still continues as uh, Spruce Grove, Stony Plain, and Laxian and Parkland continue to probably have the highest source of workers that were displaced when that sector was prematurely shut down uh, a couple years ago. But I guess I was just hoping in the last couple seconds, if you could just confirm uh, what Alberta's progress to date, and will we actually be able to uh, complete the phase out of coal by 2030? Yeah, thank you. As I mentioned previously, we are on track to uh, completely phase off coal uh, this year. And uh, according to the Alberta Utilities Commission, uh, the total installed generating capacity. Sorry, Minister. We'll now move on to a 10 minute block for the official opposition, and I assume we're going to block time again, so five minutes to you, uh, Member. I mean, I'll try for back and forth, but... <laughs> we'll block. Uh, okay. Um, so I think just because of the, the nature of the block time, we're sort of uh, running out of time to get answers. So I think uh, in this instance, I'm just going to ask two questions, then pass it over to the minister, and I'll come back with the rest of my questions um, uh, in, in future blocks. Um, so the first question is about, because I think... Um, I think that you gave me the numbers for the, the last fiscal, so the fiscal that's we're in current, well, are we still in it currently? Yes, we are still in it currently. Um, so I'm just looking for the foregone fuel tax revenue projected in 23-24. Um, I know, Minister, that you said that that was part of, um, part of the contingency fund, but obviously that isn't just a, a random, oh, sorry, that one wasn't part of the contingency fund, my apologies. Um, sorry, that would be in the projections, the revenue projections, obviously. Um, so I'm just wondering what, what we're estimating the foregone fuel tax revenue to be for 23-24, because you'll know what the benchmarks are for where it phases in and out, and you know what you projected oil to be. So I assume that someone somewhere has done that calculation. Um, the second question is on the natural gas program, which you did say was in... Um, the contingency fund, which again, I'm just, I'm just assuming that as, as, you know, we all attempt to be wise fiscal managers, that you wouldn't just have a giant slush fund sitting around, and so you would have made some sort of estimate in the contingency fund of how much um, certain programs were, uh, and so I'm just wondering how much of that was expected to be for the natural gas program, and that's the contingency fund for 23-24. So just to repeat for both questions, it's for 23-24, and I'm just asking how much you expect to forego in revenue on the fuel tax and how much you expect Albertans to benefit from on the natural gas program because, I mean, I continue to be of the view and understand from experts that, in fact, that program still will continue to be a fake program that, in fact, has no money allocated to it. Uh, so those are the two questions. Thanks. Uh, thank you to the member th for the questions. Again, the, the projected uh, cost or foregone uh, fuel tax revenue would be $570 million uh, for 23-24, and, and then the program would, of course, uh, uh, the cost would be based on oil prices, as the program after June 30th is based on oil price triggers. Uh, in terms of the contingency, um, uh, that's, uh, there's $1.5 billion, I believe, in this budget. Uh, inter for contingency, and, and that would be for disasters, emergencies, unforeseen uh, events, uh, and uh, but it could also include um, affordability measures, and um, uh, but that is a, t a Treasury Board and Finance item and question, and so I would encourage you to, to direct the, the questions on the contingency to Treasury Board and Finance. Thank you, Minister. We'll now move over to the Government Caucus for a 10-minute block. Uh, Mr. Orr, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and thank you, Minister, for being here. Um, so um, I, I want to refer reference most of my questions to outcome number two, safe, reliable, affordable utility system, uh, which includes, of course, the concept of being modern, competitive, and adaptive, and uh, 
addressing the costs, of course, to Albertans and uh, a regulatory regime that is formulated to best serve Albertans. So my questions to start with are going to address the issue of uh, self-supply, which is part of our regulatory system, part of policy. Um, and, I, and I guess I have a couple of questions there. Um, one, one of the concerns relates to self-supply with export uh, as part of our reality in, in Alberta. Um, my concern there has to do, though, with the unattended consequence of downloading grid costs onto retail consumers, because in many cases they're able to avoid grid costs when they go behind the fence. Um, so, I would, so I'd appreciate your comments on that particular piece and how you're going to address that. Has anything been done to um, keep it fair for, for Albertans? Yeah, thank you to the member for the question. So uh, enabling self-supply with export will promote investment in generation for self-supply, but will also uh, allow the export of excess capacity to the electricity market. And of course, that would put downward uh, uh, pressure on the, on the pool price. This allows large industrial consumers to lower their production costs and earn extra revenue through exports to the electricity market. Interest in self-supply with export is growing. Uh, it is currently only permitted in limited circumstances, and these limitations are seen as a barrier uh, to investment and the attraction of new opportunities. Existing exemptions that allow self-supply with export include industrial oper operations with an industrial system designation, microgenerators, oil and gas facilities <laughs> using natural gas that would otherwise be flared, and certain municipally owned generators. We are further enabling self-supply with export through the Electricity Statutes, Modernizing Alberta's Electricity Grid Amendment Act 2022, which includes amending legislation and regulation to broadly enable unlimited self-supply with export, requiring that self-supply with export facilities pay their fair share of system costs through the Alberta Electric System Operators, or ISOs, tariff, and ensuring all self-supply with export projects are aligned with independent system operator rules as any other generating unit. This will provide uh, regulatory clarity to Albertans who are interested in self-supply with export but do not currently qualify uh, for an ISD or an industrial system designation. These could include pulp and paper processing facilities or greenhouses who wish to offset their own electricity use and also develop a revenue stream by selling excess power uh, to the grid. Uh, thank you. So thank you. I think I heard you saying that, that you tried to make it fair, addressing the download costs onto retail consumers. Um, are you confident that you're going to get there, and if so, when? We're, we're consulting with uh, industry to make sure that we get that, that right, but I it, absolutely everybody should pay their fair share. Everybody who connects to the grid, utilizes the grid, um, uh, should pay their fair share. Yeah, okay. Uh, separate question, but related. Um, how are you going to address the issue um, that is sometimes called economic withholding by some of the generators who choose not to deliver power to the grid unless the price is at a threshold that they're happy with? And you could say somewhat in an attempt to make sure the price stays up there by refusing to, to deliver power to the grid. How do you address that issue of economic withholding? Well, the, the primary way that... Uh that we're going to address power prices is through competition. Economic withholding is a feature of our market. Uh, it is an allowable pro practice, and generators are engaging in it and utilizing it, and at times it does increase uh, the pool price. But it also sends market signals. It sends uh, signals that are resulting in uh, six to 7,000 megawatts of new generation that are expected to come online in our province in the coming year. Um, so... Uh, you know, we've, we've created a competitive uh, market for electricity generation. It is attracting new generation, and ultimately that is the best way uh, to provide the lowest cost electricity to Albertans. We'll continue to evaluate our market, things like economic withholding, our congestion-free policy, the, our transmission and distribution regimes. We're going to continue to evaluate it to make sure that it is meeting the needs of Albertans. Um, and we'll, of course, consult with industry participants participants and Albertans before making any uh, major changes. Thank you. 
Okay, I, I do think that is a challenge if we're if we're if our goal is formulate a policy that best serves Albertans because. Anyway, but I'll leave it. I appreciate your answer. Um, I know it's a challenge to work around. Um, let's let's change the subject a little bit. Um, um, energy storage. Uh, you know, if we're if we're really going to um, use our market-based renewable electricity generation, um, I think one of the questions that that gets raised a lot is is with regards to storage. It's it's um, one of our one of the key objectives 2.1 as well. Um, so since it's important, how are you going to encourage energy storage? Um, can you, you get any sense of what the impact might be on our electricity system? Um, and can you provide maybe some uh, some um, I don't know an overview of some existing or proposed energy storage projects that are that are on the horizon for Alberta? Yeah, thank you to the minister, to the member for the question. We passed uh, legislation last spring, the Electricity Statutes Amendment Act, uh, which enabled uh, energy storage by incorporating a legal definition of energy storage, allowing distribution and transmission utilities to own and operate energy storage assets as part of their regulated functions within clearly prescribed limits, and by allowing the use of competitive processes to procure energy storage assets for distribution and transmission services. This legislation addresses the regulatory uncertainty cited by many developers as the reason for not moving forward with energy storage projects. We're creating new opportunities to store energy at times when prices are low for use later when prices are high, also known as energy arbitrage, and providing non-wires alternatives on the distribution and transmission system for further cost savings. Enabling storage in uh, legislation combined with our commitment to a competitive market has already encouraged the development of over 3,000 megawatts of energy storage projects that are, that are now in the planning stages. The ISO is currently developing new services that will leverage the unique properties of energy storage resources. Uh, it has procured 30 megawatts of energy storage capacity to help it develop uh, technical requirements. The potential impact uh, energy storage resources bring many benefits, including helping reduce the long-term cost of electricity in Alberta, enabling the integration of intermittent renewable energy resources, and optimizing the investment in future transmission and distribution infrastructure. Energy storage technologies offer proponents and generators a significant degree of flexibility in how they can meet their electricity needs. With the flexibility of both location and scale, Energy storage has the potential to enhance the efficiency and resilience of the electricity system from both the planning and operational perspectives. These assets can provide efficient and effective transmission and distribution services that can in some circumstances be more cost effective and easier to implement than a wire solution requiring costly new infrastructure. Uh, and those costs, as you know, are often passed on to ratepayers. In the energy-only market, as storage resources can reduce the pool price by promoting the integration of the renewable energy resources through offers in the ancillary market. Energy storage resources can also reduce cost by storing renewable energy output during periods of low demand and discharging during periods of high demand, creating more competitiveness in the market during peak or tight hours, which will help manage pool prices. So again, uh, we've got 3,000 megawatts of energy storage projects that are now in the planning stages. So a number of projects. I've only got a minute left. Um, maybe you can answer this in the next section, but I want to move on to um, 2.4 talks about system reliability. Um, and uh, I think the reliability of the system, of course, is extremely important. Um, so I'm just wondering maybe two things. Um, how, how are you planning or, or thinking about protecting against system disruptions, such as extreme weather events? We saw that a couple of years ago in Texas. Secondly, I'm wondering, where does the retail consumer, how, do, how should I say this, the consumer generator, um, distributed generation, how does that fit into system reliability? And are we doing anything to enhance um, the consumer's contribution to stability in the grid through, through generation? I think especially in the urban areas, uh, as we get into electric cars and all the rest of it, the demand is going to be massive. Uh, we need some, some local generation, if I can dare call it that. Uh, are you taking that into account in any way as you move forward? And there's only seven seconds yes to give you an answer next time. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thank you. We'll now move on to a 10-minute block for the official opposition. And uh, mem Member Gamble, you have up to five minutes. Thank you. Um, okay. So I'm actually going to jump in on 
uh, some of the questions that were just offered by the member from Lacombe Uh I thought that was some interesting information. Um, so I know, um, as was mentioned, that a, a tariff with respect to this expanded self-supply and export is under development. I'm just uh, wondering when we expect that to be developed. Um, it's been ongoing for a while. Um, the other question I had, and I think I posed it before, but we probably ran out of time, is around um, energy storage. Um, I know the act is in, but certainly what I have heard is the fact that, because um, you can, if you sort of pair storage with your renewable in its own area, you can bring storage on fairly easily to sell at different times. But if it's sort of standalone, it's still charged as a generator and a load. Um, I mean, it's my understanding that to encourage the adoption of more uh, of more storage, you, you would want to change that. Um, I'm just wondering if work is underway on those rules and regulations to alter that. Um, you also indicated that there's 3,000 megawatts of energy storage um, that's planned. I was wondering if that's standalone storage or if it's storage that's sort of paired with renewable kind of behind the fence. Um, uh, one of the ones I wanted to circle back to uh, was in, um, sorry, in the uh, uh, the estimates, uh, line 2.1, affordability and utilities. That doesn't, as far as I understand, contain any actual payments to Albertans. Um, so it went from uh, five million and a half, roughly, to just over 12 million, uh, it sort of doubled. So I'm just, I'm really curious why that went, because it's all in the same year. It's from budget to forecast. So I'm just sort of curious why that increased so much. Um, I also wanted to circle back. Um, I know the original answer said that all six political staff employed in the ministerial office came from energy. Um, I mean, that's fine. I'm not that interested in who who precisely the staff are. It's just that presumably when they split the Ministry of Energy into two, they took the office budget and split it. The energy office budget went from uh, $667,000 to $1.048 million, 57% uh, increase. Your Minister's office budget went from 572,000 to 832,000, which is, or sorry, 847,000, which is a 48% increase. So I'm just curious, like I'm not interested in where the actual staff went. I'm just curious, um, you know, why, why, why we need so many extra political staff. Um, and this seems to be through a throughout government problem. So I'm just, I'm just curious at a time, um, you know, when Albertans are struggling so much, why we're spending so much on political staff. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, one of the things I wanted to return to was in your business plan, the discussion of reviewing transmission, distribution, and other costs. I'm just, I'm just trying to get a sense of, like, what that review is, who's involved in that review. Is the review public? Um, you know, will it be done... Uh, yeah, will it be done in a public forum? If so, you know, what is the public forum? What's the mechanism for, for Albertans to provide their sort of feedback on that? Um, I would be interested in that. Um, and I think uh, probably the other thing that I wanted to go back to was around... Um, the affordability payments, and I appreciate the decision to include people with children. I think it's the right decision. That's a great decision. Um, it's just I think that all of the factors that you cited, like in terms of increased costs and increased groceries and increased housing costs and those sort of difficulties all apply to post-secondary students also. Um, so I'm just, I'm just curious why those folks were excluded. I appreciate you saying that you know, the percentage on student loans has gone down. Well, it went down because you put it up. Um, it was the UCP government that raised it in the first place. So just reversing your own decision um, isn't really, uh, I would say, an improvement in the circumstances of students. Um, and so I'm, I'm just, you know, they, they have all the same factors about food bank usage being up. I'm just wondering why they were left out. Thank you. Member, Minister, you have five minutes to respond. 
Yeah, thank you to the member for the questions. And um, um, again, um, we've, we've provided both broad-based and targeted inflation relief affordability supports. And uh, uh, we talked, the member talked about families and students. And families and students are both eligible, of course, to benefit from our fuel tax relief program. Uh, 13 cents per liter, 13.6 cents per liter uh, from January until June on every liter of gas and diesel uh, until at least June 30th, at which, which point the program will revert uh, to oil price triggers, and that's providing real support. Uh, we've also provided electricity rebates. Again, families and students, or families including students, will benefit from up to $500 in electricity rebates from July um, uh, to April 2023, from July 2022 to April 2023. We've also made other changes that will benefit both students and families, like our changes to income tax. Um, affordable childcare, let's remember, some students are parents. Uh, they're saving between $400 and $650 a month in affordable childcare. We've made investments and in supports related to uh, low-income transit, again, available to families and students. Uh, and then, on, uh, you know, we're committed to ensuring post-secondary education is accessible and, and affordable. So we announced four measures specific to students. Uh, for the first was a cap to tuition increases for domestic students at public institutions, which we capped at 2% at the institution level from the 2024-25 year onwards. I, as the member uh, noted, we reduced the interest rate on student loans. Uh, but this was after a period of uh, significant, the, the most rapid rise in interest rates in, in recent history. Um, this is also from a position of fiscal strength. The budget is balanced. You know, this is after, it's after three years of fiscal restraint and with a balanced budget that we are in a position to provide these affordability supports, to provide this inflation relief, and to do things like remove the interest, uh, reduce the interest rate on student loans. For students, we also extended the student loan grace period from six months to 12 months. We doubled it. Uh, so that students would have time to find gainful employment. Again, there's 100,000 uh, jobs available in Alberta right now. We have the highest weekly earnings in the country. We have the lowest taxes. Um, and we also increase the eligibility for the repayment assistance program. So four measures specific to post-secondary students, in addition to all the broad-based relief uh, that they and families are eligible for. Uh, uh, we also provided uh, targeted relief to families because again families spend more on fuel and heat and homes and, and, and groceries than uh, uh, than individuals and we wanted to ensure that children again were held harmless from the impacts of inflation and the, and the high cost of living that comes with it so we provided all families in Alberta all low and middle income families in Alberta with up to six hundred dollars over six months a hundred dollars a month for each child under 18 and we excluded the top 20 percent wealthiest families because again we wanted to target this additional uh, inflation relief and affordability support to low and middle income alberta families so i, I hope it's it's clear that we've provided um significant broad-based relief to all albertans including students and then we've provided targeted inf inflation relief to students through the four measures that i detailed and targeted uh, support for families through the affordability payments. And again, there's over 1.1 million Albertans enrolled on that program. It's been very successful. Uh, credit to the to the government uh, and specifically technology and innovation for rolling that out uh, very quickly for Albertans. There was other questions that I'd like to get to. Uh, for example, uh, there was a question related to estimate line uh, 2.1. Matt. Okay, thank you, Minister. So, yeah, the, the, uh, that expense item went up to $12.2 million from the $5.6 million. You're right, it doesn't include any of the actual re rebate program, or payments, sorry, but it does uh, include development and developing and implementing the affordability action plan. And that includes a campaign to inform Albertans of how to obtain affordability payments. It also includes the uh, work on the review of the regulated rate option and additional resources and supplies and services necessary to fulfill the mandate's priorities. So that's where a big chunk of our department staff sits as well. Yeah, and that, that's a great point. So we, of course, wanted to make every senior in Alberta aware of the various affordability support programs that were available, particularly the affordability payments. We wanted to share with families that there is... 
So, the Minister will now go to the Government Caucus, uh, con continue with uh, back and forth. I'll, uh, there we go. <laughs> I'll give the opportunity to respond to the reliability piece. Um, again, just about system disruptions, uh, weather events, and whether or not there is some place in that equation for the uh, self-supply at the retail level, um, you know, generate the electricity where it's used. Would that help alleviate the pressure on the system? Yes, thank you for the question. So uh, Alberta has a robust and reliable system developed to operate effectively in varying conditions, including our province's significant seasonal temperature swings. Generally speaking, there is more than adequate electricity supply in Alberta. The province currently has over 18,000 megawatts of installed capacity in the system to serve a peak demand, we just hit a record recently, uh, of around 12,000 megawatts. The ISO is responsible for the reliable operation of the power grid. And to ensure that the system remains stable, the ISO procures additional power to hold in reserve and can take mitigating actions when the power system is under stress. Last winter, the ISO closely monitored the convergence of extreme cold temperatures, tight supply conditions, and increased reliance on natural gas for electricity generation, which had the potential to impact system reliability. The same conditions could be seen next winter. During tight conditions, the ISO first suspends electricity exports, then alerts industry that conditions are tight before finally utilizing reserves. Industry notifications can assist in reducing overall load on the system through reduced consumption and or greater reliance on self-supply generation. Once the ISO begins using reserves, it issues an energy emergency alert or grid alert to the public where consumers are asked to reduce their electricity consumption to help mitigate the possibility of the ISO needing to undertake more serious emergency measures to balance the system. During a grid alert, the ISO may also cancel transmission maintenance to ensure all available electricity is flowing, implement voluntary curtailment programs where participants are asked to reduce their energy use to predetermined levels, and request emergency imports. As the last option to maintain reliability, the ISO can initiate temporary rotating power outages. Grid alerts typically occur during the peak hours of electricity consumption, which is 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. A grid alert is communicated via ISO's uh, social media accounts and website to help curb some non-essential demand and preserve emergency reserve capacity. The grid alert will remain in place until the power system is back to normal. And the ISO has not been required to implement rolling outages due to lack of sup electricity su supply in nine years. The system's working. So while it might sound concerning, these alerts are actually an indication that the system and the protections it entails are working as, in as intended for Albertans. As I said, last winter the ISO closely monitored the convergence of extreme cold temperatures, tight supply conditions, and increased reliance on natural gas for electricity generation. Uh, and in December 2022, Alberta set a new all-time hourly peak demand of 12,193 megawatts, and several grid alerts were issued due to a prolo prolonged extreme cold snap coinciding with unplanned generator outages. The alerts were short-lived, and the system conditions returned to normal. And, um, uh, yeah, thank you. Minute left. Um... So let's just touch on the little piece. I appreciate the, the grid alerts asking consumers not to use power when there's a challenge. But can, do you see us moving to an era where grid alerts to the retail generator, I'm going to use that language, I don't know what else to call them, could be also alerted to contribute power to the system to back it up? Certainly the, the, the future is uh, uh, the bi-directional flow of electricity and distributed generation. Uh, of course, you've got to have a lot of technology in place for that all to work. Um, so right now, we, we see it as both an opportunity but also a challenge. The grid must evolve to fully uh, utilize distributed generation and to have the, uh, the by-flow of electricity. So the short answer is yes. Well, uh, Mr. Chair, three, two, one. <laughs> I apologize for the interruption, but I must advise the committee that the time allotted for this portion of consideration of the ministry's estimates has concluded. I'd like to remind committee members 
that we are scheduled to meet in a half an hour at 7, 7 p.m. to continue our consideration of the estimates of the Ministry of Affordability and Utilities. We will be switching rooms to the Rocky Mountain Room, so grab a quick bite to eat and meet us there. And please be reminded there is no food allowed in the committee rooms. We will be starting promptly at 7 o'clock. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned.